Chaos, pure, malignant, tumultuous mayhem. It is the way of things in the Fated Place, a world which sits among a greater web of planets and realms without number. It is a planet of mortals, monsters and gods, set in a universe of unknown reaches. This is the tale of that place's end, a crescendo of war, disease, sorcery and hedonism. Welcome to our story of the end times of the Warhammer Fantasy universe. These long episodes are difficult to make, so consider liking, sharing, commenting and subscribing. This world of fantasy battles may be coming to an end, but there's still plenty of action to enjoy as this video on Warhammer is sponsored by War Thunder. In this modern vehicle combat game, you take over 2000 vehicles from the 1920s to today into intense PvP combat. Commandeer ships, planes and tanks in massive combined arms PvP battles across all kinds of terrain and the sky. And with so many weapons to use, the damage x-ray feature comes in very handy, as you'll see what effect your shots have on the targets in deadly detail. Customize your vehicles, enjoy the absolute accuracy of these machines of war and their detailed models, and get into competition for all levels of skill and seriousness. Join the fight now on PC, PS5, Xbox Series X and S, or older generation consoles, but make sure to do it via our link below to get a large bonus pack that unlocks premium vehicles, boosters, discounts and free premium account time. Available to new players and those who haven't played for at least 6 months, it comes with an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicles, but is only available for a limited time. Hit the link in the description. Before chaos or order on this planet, there was nothing. An untouched primal world, ready to be reaped of her blessings. There, the Old Ones came and created the Slan and Saurus to defend and protect the planet in the name of their great plan. Then came the younger races of Elves, Men, Dwarves and Orcs. Before long, minor battles erupted between them over differing religions, culture and monopoly over resources. Yet the worst was yet to come. In their grand design, the Old Ones linked each planet that had caught their eye with great polar gates, connecting their astral empire together like a massive web. These gates could be small to allow individual travel, or large enough to allow massive celestial objects like moons to freely pass through. Their creation was divine, Yet this world was not as well as it had seemed. Unknowingly, the Polar Gates served as a first step for a strange and sickening realm to trespass into this young planet. The Gates unintentionally served as a looking glass into the Aether, or the Realm of Chaos, an indecipherable place of pure magic and home of gods and demons. There the conventional laws of reality were not set in stone, even a mortal mind that attempted to grasp the senseless disorder of the realm would go mad. All things of reason, of space, of cause and effect are variable and at the will of none but the Chaos Gods, who give their dimension form through the fears, wants, thoughts and feelings of mortals. Here reign the four most infamous and chiefest gods, Khorne, Sinch, Slanesh and Nurgle. Khorne is Chaos God of rage, violence and murder. He embodies mortal desires of vengeance, conquest and pure nauseating rage. The lesser demons Khorne commands are the pinnacle of savage courage and berserking bloodlust. For their obedience and worship, Khorne gives his followers great individual power in combat. Among the four, Khorne is the mightiest of all Chaos Gods for every act of murder, violence and killing grants him power, whether it was done by his followers or not. Khorne cares not from whence the blood flows, only that it does. Sinch is the name of the Chaos God of manipulation, change and sorcery. He bears a near endless list of titles, with the greatest being the Changer of Ways, Master of Fortune, the Great Conspirator and the Architect of Fate. His domain is married with magic, dynamic mutation and grand scheming. He embodies mortal ambition, desire for truths and aspirations of change. From the Chaos Realm, he hears the dreams and hopes of mortals and diligently watches their plans take form. Yet he is not content to only observe, 
and will interfere with fate to bring about his own incredibly complex plans and schemes. History, destiny, intrigue and all plots are of Sinch's greatest interests, with an even greater desire to warp them into his own. Slanesh is the name of the Chaos God of passion, pleasure and decadence. Even when he's referred to as the Prince of Excess, Slanesh can assume any form, be it male, female, hermaphrodite or entirely sexless. When gazed upon by mortal eyes, Slanesh takes up the form they'll find most attractive. Mortal lust, self-indulgence and pride are the domains of Slanesh. Korn considers Slanesh his great rival, for he considers the Dark Prince his opposite in nearly every facet. Nurgle is the name of the Chaos God of Rot, Death and Destruction. Known as the Fly Lord, the Great Corrupter, Master of Pestilence and Lord of Decay, he represents mortal morbidity, illness, physical corruption and their intense desire to achieve immortality and freedom from pain. Nurgle prefers the form of a fat, pox-infested creature with antlers and a grotesquely massive body. Ironically, Nurgle is thought of as the friendliest Chaos God, for he is the only one to harbour care for his followers. The Lord of Decay is jolly, happy and kind in his mannerisms and considers himself the opposite of Sinch. Tragically, the Polar Gates collapsed in the very early history of the planet. The dangerous Chaos Realm was allowed to pour in like a flood following a broken dam. This event, known as the Great Catastrophe, ripped a tear in reality and brought forth demonic hordes determined to run amok in the pristine world, seeding horror, imbalance and dark pleasures. In desperation, the mortal armies fought to save their forever cursed world. Their hope resided in one incredibly dangerous spell, the creation of the Vortex. The elves managed to form an ever-spinning maelstrom of raw power that absorbed the excess magic that had poured through the broken gates and banished the demons of chaos from their beloved realm. And then, for some time, chaos was kept at bay. Millennia passed, and while the Vortex was effective in its design, it was not perfect. The winds of magic still blew freely throughout the realm, gifting mortals with fantastical feats and corrupting others. The forces of chaos waxed and waned in power for centuries, biding their time and chewing at the bit for that fateful day when they would overrun the world again. The pinnacle of chaos's power rested in the selection of an ever chosen, the highest position attainable within the ranks of the mortal champions of chaos. The ever chosen were those men who had won the blessings of all chaos gods and united the tribes of barbaric mortals who lived in the shadows of the fallen warp gates and the realm of chaos itself. As the ever chosen, these infamous generals were those in which the chaos gods united wholly. Even the very earth under the feet of the ever chosen sundered and split. Nature revolted in agony at the presence of dreadful apocalypse incarnate. Twelve ever chosen had arisen since the great catastrophe. Each time they entered the realm to herald doom, the mortal powers of the realm were successful in driving them back to the northern chaos wastes. The chiefest and greatest tale is the valiant defeat of the first ever chosen, Morkar the Uniter by Sigmar Heldenhammer, through a great battle of single combat. Yet the grand tale of triumph over evil would eventually begin to fade into a forgotten hope during the end times, for the 13th was anointed. His mortal name, Diedrich Kastner, was cast aside as the faith of the Chaos Gods was placed on his shoulders. Archon the Ever Chosen, the Three-Eyed King, would command the last and greatest Chaos invasion, leading to the true end of this accursed realm. The rise of Archon's power is just as grand of a tale as his actions following the beginning of the end times. Truly the herald of the apocalypse, he succeeded in fulfilling six impossible trials and claimed the six treasures of chaos as his prizes. This marked him as a true ever chosen and gifted him with demonic blessings and power overflowing. These treasures included the armor of Morkar, the first ever chosen, 
which enabled the wearer to be invulnerable to all but the most ferocious and powerful of attacks. The Eye of Shirian, granting the bearer prophetic visions and the ability to predict and avoid attacks from their enemy. The Steed of the Apocalypse, a great beast stolen from a demon prince within the realm of chaos, tracking ruin and fire beneath the thunder of his feet. The Slayer of Kings, weapon of the second ever chosen and bestower of murderous power. And finally, the Crown of Domination, which struck fear and terror into those that lay eyes upon its hellish splendor. The eternally burning Mark of Chaos, which Archon bore upon his head, combined all the blessings of the Chaos Gods and signified their unified confirmation of the Ever Chosen. With these treasures under his command, the Demon Prince Belakor performed a shadowy coronation that snuffed out the last remnant of Archon's humanity. Finally accepting the Gods of Chaos to be the true rulers of the cosmos, he set off to begin his Tramp of Doom across the realm. In the land of mist, the danger is closer still. Pride has ever been the folly of that shrouded land, and so it will be again. When the dragons fly as one, an ancient lie will at last be exposed, a revelation that will shake Ulthuan to the roots of its mountains. The mirror of light and dark will shatter, and Anarian's heirs will fight for the legacy of Cain amidst the ashes of the Phoenix. Prophecy of the End Times 2519 IC, the cursed year of the beginning of the apocalypse. The twin-tailed comet, often thought of as an omen, tore through the heavens and stole the gaze of all mortals, signifying the start of horrors to come. Within the realm of chaos, the Court of Covenants were graced with the presence of the gods themselves, Agreeing to unite their foul powers under the banner of the Ever Chosen, the northern wastes stirred with immense power. A great wind of foul magic swept through the land, tearing minor rifts in reality. From each tear poured a host of demons, seeding destruction throughout the world. In the north, the tribes of Norsken men turned their attention to this new and promising Ever Chosen. Upon his throne of brass and bone did Archon accept the allegiance of those bloodlust-driven tribes. Some tribes ventured south to quench their thirst for war, but for all of Archon's power, he was also patient. He did not intervene in these delays, for he knew that those worthy of following him would come, and those that were not would face the wrath of the hungering gods behind him. Drenok Johansson was one such chieftain of the Norsken tribes that refused to bend the knee to Archon. He had seen the horror that the promise of power from these foul gods had caused, for he had slain his demon-possessed father and claimed the legendary Axe of Icefang, symbol of his people. He was determined to bring honor to the death of his father and set forth to defend the coming advances from the north. There he made his stand upon the slopes of Icefang and fought a bloody battle. The forces of Chaos rallying to meet Drenok and the Icefang tribe on the battlefield followed the banner of the demon prince Kastragar, who was a bloody champion devoted to Khorne, and in his mortal life he succeeded in annihilating every single goblin within Nashrak's lair. With this great offering of suffering and murder to Khorn, he blessed him as a demon prince and Kastragar travelled back to the Chaos Realm to prepare for his ultimate servitude. Bearing the Great Axe, Drenok made his stand and slaughtered Khorne's legions by the hundreds. He defended his pride, his people, and the honour of his fallen father for hours. But eventually, the general of the minor Khorn force emerged. Demon Prince Kastragar and Drenok met upon the slopes of Icefang, while the rest of Norska observed. Would this young chieftain herald yet another defiant resistance against the end of the very world? After much time in single combat, the demon prince Kastragar took his trophy that the blood god had demanded. The valiant Drenok fell to the demon prince, and so too did the remaining Norsken resistance melt. 
The tribes of Acelings, Vargs, Siles and Basinlings were mobilized by the emerging Chaos champions. Those who still refused, such as the King of Giants Stearmir Rhymefrost, were assassinated by relatives of previous leaders. As if that were not enough to strike fear into the remaining chieftains, the forces of Chaos turned their eye to the Nordic dwarves that also occupied the land. Kraka Drak, meaning Dragonhold in the tongue of dwarfs, was the city of the last great king Silverbeard, and served as the location for the first siege of the end times. Led by Valkyr the Bloody, demon princess of Khorne, and once grand warrior queen of the Norsken clan Schwarzwolf, the siege would see an important assault of the Nordic dwarves of the far north. This was the first true test of the might of the united forces of Chaos. Demon Princess Valkyr saw bolstering numbers from the remaining Jotuns of Norska joining her violent and horrible crusade against the dwarves of Krakadrak. While the dwarves were notoriously famous for both their heritage in defending against Chaos and blessed with arguably the most stalwart tactics in war, Krakadrak was severely outnumbered and under-supported. With no hope for reinforcements nor replenishment of supplies, the dwarves bolstered what defenses they could and prepared for the onslaught. The initial assault of the forces of Chaos led by Valkyr were of no surprise to the dwarves, but what was alarming was the sheer support of the Norsken Jotuns at her back. The legion was unstoppable against the stone walls of the dwarves. Like a red thirsting tide did the legions crash against the battlements of Krakadrak, every assault draining the dwarves of resources and morale. Each attack reminded the mountain men that their hold held no reserve of forces, food or spirit that could turn the tides of the siege. They remained at the walls of Krakadrak, defending her splendor for weeks, until she eventually ran out of resources and her bearded warriors began to fall at an incredible pace. With no tactical means of retreat and recuperation, a deadly decision had to be made. The once rich and bustling dragon hold had been totally ravaged in the name of the god of war. In the wake of destruction and thousands of dead kin, the few survivors dove underground in a retreat to the ancient caves of their forefathers. With the many dwarves that had perished, so too had many of the Jotuns and demons of Khorne. Yet still they advanced after the last of the Nordic dwarves, with even further reinforcement after the bloody display of dominance. Other Jarls joined the Blood Queen Valkyr and the blooded champion Hargroth, fearful of what their defiance of this great force of chaos would bring in terms of consequences. The dwarves fled northwest through underground tunnels and caves to Kraka Dorden. Kraka Dorden held the tides back much more efficiently than Kraka Drak, partly due to its superior defensive position but also due to the legendary drake cannons of the fort's mountainside, waiting to unleash a fiery storm of mighty dwarven engineering upon any demon who ventured too deep into the mountain. Once the hordes of chaos had arrived at the battlements of Kraka Dorden, the dwarves opened a line of dragonfire upon the legions and annihilated all but their lieutenant, Kjol Thunderhand. Surviving the initial blaze, Thunderhand charged forth and met the axes of Dorvan footmen alone. Despite his ferocious attack upon the Dorvan front line, he fell beneath the throng of angry axes. Despite this initial victory, Cracker Dorden, much like Cracker Drak, would fall when a flanking force of Valkyr's armies finally crossed the mountains and assaulted the city gates. This catastrophic series of events would continue to sweep the minor forts of the dwarves until they retreated all the way to the port of Shok Traken. Some Dorvan forts, such as Kraka Onsmatek, were even destroyed from the inside. Speculation has offered explanations such as sabotage or desperation on the part of the dwarves, but none survived to offer an accurate tale of what actually transpired. Once at the port of Shok Traken, with the hope of uniting their southern cousins, the dwarves met with a surprise ambush by Chaos Champion Gutrot Spoom's Plague Fleet. The Lord of Tentacles delighted in proving himself in the shadow of his former failures, and placed the final nail in the coffin of the Nordic dwarves. The dwarven fleet sank into the frigid depths of the frozen sea. 
Satisfied with the great toll of skulls and beards collected for corn, Valkyria turned her forces towards the Dark Elven realms. Meanwhile, Archon's vanguard would mobilize and soon set forth a march towards Kislev. You look down on us and think we are little better than barbarians, but you should be glad we are, for without us here, the northern tribes would be dining on the flesh of your children in your burning homes. But for the courage that flows in our veins, would your lands be theirs? Look down on us? You should get on your knees and thank us every day! Vitalia Kovash, Kislevite Winged Lancer Kislev was ruled by a line of mighty Tsars and Tsarinas, monarchs representing the regal ancestry of horse warriors of the eastern steppes thousands and thousands of years prior. He or she is the ultimate authority of all spiritual, military and legal matters of their territory that has consistently and successfully balanced the need to defend their northern border from chaos assaults and the requirement to cooperate with their southern siblings of humanity. When the Tsar Boris Boka was slain in an ambush by Chaos Horse Warriors hailing from the eastern steppes during a defense of Kislev's northern border, the last and greatest Tsarina would be crowned in 2517 IC, Katerin the Ice Queen. Hers was a heavy burden, for she assumed a great yoke of responsibility to not only her people but to the whole world to stave off the tide of doom from the northern wastes. When she was younger, she was allowed to study ice magic, a particularly dangerous branch of arcane mastery. Able to command the icy soul of Kislev itself in great feats of deadly and wonderful splendor, some even began to wonder if she was the reincarnation of the first Tsarina, Miska, also the master of ice magic. Katerin rose to the throne of Kislev when her father perished. At her coronation, she amassed her ice magic to create a grand palace of ice, where she would rule firmly and fairly. Unlike her father, the Ice Queen governed through agents and generals, instead of commanding from the front, and would only appear on the battlefield in the most crucial times. However, when she led the charge, she was always astride a great glimmering steed of winter majesty, with shining flanks of ice crystals and a breath like a winter wind. With such power over the elements and devotion from her soldiers, there was clear proof that she had the blood of the first Kislevite rulers flowing strongly through her veins. Katerin, in addition to her two gloriously frigid mounts she would bring into battle, bore two legendary pieces of war gear. Fear Frost was a blade forged by the first female ruler of Kislev, Miska, and passed down to each succeeding Tsarina. Only a Tsarina could wield Fear Frost, and when a man would attempt to even lift the blade, he would find himself frozen to death within a heartbeat. Infused with ice magic, the intense cold of the weapon turned even a single scratch into a deadly affair. The Crystal Cloak was a cloak that Katerin wore, enveloping her with a swirling mist of dancing ice crystals that served as the ultimate defense. Together, they blessed Katerin with the destructive power of deep winter on the battlefield. You all know I bore no heirs, but I have all my sons and daughters here with me today. On this rain-soaked hill, we are all one people, one land. Today we fight for Kislev. Today we fight for her lost sons and daughters, for her proud mothers and fathers. Kislev is people, and people are Kislev. Tsarina Katerin, the Ice Queen of Kislev One of the Ice Queen's first initiatives as Tsarina was to see the end of an incursion of Elfric Sienwulf's Wolven Warriors, accursed and corn-worshipping regiments of this Chaos Champion's armies. Marching further inland to Uzbea, or Ursin's Teeth, the Ice Queen left the capital to ensure the Sacred Valley would remain protected. With this vital misstep, a herald of Archon saw the perfect opportunity to invade Kislev. Vardek Krom the Conqueror marched south into the icy plains of Kislev territory. Much to his surprise, he met with resistance, not by a great army of secret Kislev reserves, but by a much more notorious warmonger, the legendary Grimgor Ironhide, the green-skinned warmaster 
grew tired of slaughtering Skaven and set forth to intercept Vardek's advancing legions in a surprise flank. Grimgor was determined to test the proclaimed might of these Chaos servants and charged forth to meet Vardek in single combat. Grimgor and Vardek clashed blades for hours, each determined to prove themselves as the superior force of fury upon the world. The orc submitted himself fully to this righteous fight against the Champion of Chaos, and in his moment of blindness, Vardek bolstered his legions to decimate Grimgor's supporting army. With the mighty Greenskin now truly alone on the battlefield, Krom disarmed Grimgor with a final and commanding sweep of his blade. Krom spared Grimgor in a strange gesture, perhaps of respect or pity, though it is likely that the champion's motives will never be known. With incomprehensible rage boiling within the Greenskin's soul, Grimgor retreated to Hort Pass. There, Grimgor would set to work immediately, determined to see this personal grudge to the end. He summoned orcs and goblins from all within his sphere of influence, who upon hearing of the great bravery of Grimgor, amassed in the largest war ever seen in history. Meanwhile, with Grimgor's antics largely unknown to Vardek Krom, the armies of Chaos advanced to the Kislevite town of Prague. This bastion of the north, Prague, had been granted the title of the Cursed City, forever locked in a ceaseless cycle of rebuilding, defending onslaught after onslaught of threats from the north. The people residing within Prague had been corrupted with mutation and madness, remaining under the mentality of siege defense forever. Even with such constant destruction and death among their streets, the citizens of Prague remained defiant. In times of fragile peace, the city was blessed with prosperous trade through the River Linsk. This made Prague a ripe target for raiding and siege, and with its attack from the north, chaos corruption would sink its roots into the city and warp the health of those that lived there. Subterfuge and corruption was also common, particularly among the vampire agents planted among the citizens and government of Prague. With Prague's proximity to Troll Country, the city was a tempting target for the Troll King Throg. Most in the Old World know trolls as great beasts of limited foresight and intelligence, Yet when the forces of Chaos closed in on the border of Troll Country, the minds of these monsters warped into unusually cunning, grim desires. Throg, the greatest in stature and newfound intelligence, announced that he would usher in a new destiny for the world, to enslave the hubris of man, starting with the accursed wealth and defensive position of Prague. It is the hubris of men to see their own destiny in all things, Von Karstein, the ever-chosen, dead men, exalted men. In their skin they are all still men. This will be the age of the beast. Throg, King of the Trolls. Determined to be the first to establish a new ice palace for his hordes of trolls, Throg began his assault on the mountain gate, northmost defense of the great city. Once the gates had been destroyed, he met with a great beast hunter of Kislev, Ilya of Morova. Astride a great bear of Kislev, he fought valiantly against the mad troll king, but ultimately met his demise when Throg crushed them both at their defense of the broken mountain gate. Without the leadership of the legendary monster hunter, Kislev's defensive bastion fell to the troll king, who established a palace of ice for himself and his kin to summon further warriors to enact the Age of the Beast. As if losing the greatest defensive outpost against the north wasn't damning enough, the Kislevite port of Eringrad soon met a maritime assault by the fleet of Gutrot Spoom, who had only recently sunk the last Nordic dwarf fleet. Eringrad, without Prague's defiant forces to support her vulnerable port in the Starovoda Bay, sustained a massive assault from the infamous Plague Fleet. Safely anchored in the port without a challenge from the shore, Gutrot's fleet fired volleys of pox-infected projectiles directly into the city. Great disease and suffering afflicted all who dared to make a defense within the city, and soon Eringrad had become a doomed ulcer upon the land, a disease mockery of its once bustling life of trade. The defensive shell around Kislev's capital 
had sundered under the pressure of overwhelming numbers from the north. The Ice Queen had still yet to return from her initiative in Ursin's teeth, and her forces were still recovering from the costly defence of this region, so sacred to Kislev. Another opportunity such as this was too tempting to the Chaos Champions, and so Mordrek the Damned rose to the challenge and besieged the heart of Kislev. Let Mordrek be a warning to all those who would seek fame and life eternal from the demon gods of Chaos, for he has both these things, and yet he is damned. Hugo Lazare's Grim Stories and Cautionary Tales Mordek himself was blessed, or cursed, with true immortality. He had suffered many deaths, many violent and bloody, only to be resurrected again to serve the Chaos Gods. Underneath his armour, his body writhes and mutates, ever changing from the constant resurrection of his form. It is rumoured that his freedom from this damned state of being is to slay in the name of his infernal masters, who will never tire of their games played upon mortal matters. Mordek commanded three gifts of Chaos's power. The Sword of Change, which mutated any foe who had the misfortune of being struck into hideous Chaos spawn. He was often astride a Chaos steed, a demonic mockery of a proud warrior's companion. With a nearly impenetrable suit of Chaos armour, Mordek was very skilled at twisting his enemies into his own puppets, killing beasts of Chaos that rend their once comrades to shreds. The damned Count assaulted the city and charged into the heart of the capital to confront the authority of the winged lancers of Kislev's Griffin Legion. The Champions of Chaos crashed like dark waves on white shores, sowing terror and destruction within the last Kislevite defenders. Mordek drew his blade and pierced the heart of the Legion, determined to demonstrate the might and authority over Chaos. Sweeping his blade against the tide of oncoming lancers, his blade smited each opponent and transformed them into twisted, rabid beasts of chaos. With the point of his sword towards the Legion's captain, he ordered the new swarm of chaos spawn to devour their previous captain alive. The captain of the Legion was devoured in front of his men, and with morale shattered, Kislev's capital melted in submission to Mordek's armies. When the Ice Queen finally returned from her defence against Sienwulf's assault, she did not find the splendour of her home to comfort her. Instead, she found the desolation of Chaos's touch upon the ancestral capital. Despite her best efforts to rally support in the Boka Palace, the net of established regiments began to strangle the palace's limited reinforcements. To ensure that the Ice Queen may carry on the legacy of Kislev's defiance towards Chaos, a sacrificial charge of Ungols, who were ancient residents of Kislev's plains, provided the Tsarina enough time and a clear enough route to escape, pass the armies of Mordek and flee to the fallen city of Erengrad, where she thought that she may find valiant warriors to help take back the capital. The strength of Kislev lies in you all. The land has called you all here, and it is here that you will put that strength to the test, defying chaos. There is power in this land, and tomorrow it will run in all your veins. Use it well. The Ice Queen of Kislev Katerin marched north with speed, and with the valiant few who still clung to hope for their destroyed homeland. When the Ice Queen entered the port city of Erengrad, she witnessed firsthand the horror of Gutrot's maritime siege. The populace was weak and dying, afflicted with innumerable disgusting diseases. When it seemed that the Ice Queen had a brief moment to guide her people towards an escape south towards the Empire, a roaming army of beastmen closed in to secure the death of all those remaining. Remaining within the city alongside agents of the Empire's Bright Order, Katarin summoned a storm of ice and fire in a final push to loosen the foothold Chaos had secured upon the world. From the doomed city of Kislev, and unbothered by the raging storm over Erengrad, the Chaos Hordes descended south, towards the foot of Balthazar Gelt's Golden Bastion, eager to further their trail of apocalyptic destruction. The Empire of Man was founded by Sigmar Heldenhammer, slayer of the first ever Chosen of Chaos. 
Through the warrior king's unwavering courage, he emboldened the tribes of barbaric men to unite under him as the first emperor of the twelve original provinces. As a token of faith, the dwarven runemaster Alaric the Mad sealed the fury of an arcane storm in twelve magical blades and gifted them to Sigmar and his first elector counts. Ownership of a runefang, as these blades were called, granted both immense strength in battle and a confirmation of an elector count's right to rule his province. Since the founding of the empire, there had been hundreds of years of peace and conflict, both internal and external. Sigmar's heirs had historically maintained a cordial relationship with their neighbours, including the dwarfs, the horse lords of Bretonia, and the now doomed Kislev. While the dwarves had wondrous machines of the world's finest engineering, and the Bretonians had their elite regiments of cavalry, the empire's development focused on their three tenets of success – faith, steel, and gunpowder. The gods of the empire rule over all, regardless of whether you are a peasant or burgher, knight or priest, rat catcher or the emperor himself, all must pay heed to the wisdom, rules and decrees of the gods. To ignore them, or worse, belittle them, is to invite disaster. Alfred Schumann, Priest of Arena Faith. It is the primary crux of the Empire's might, compelling its loyal men and women to defend what their ancestors bled for. While there are multiple gods and cults within the provinces, all faith eventually leads back to the figureheads of the Empire itself, as they symbolize the success and authority of the nation as a whole. Additionally, the people of the Empire erected the Eight Colleges of Magic, providing the Emperor with wizards and sorcerers to defend the Empire's splendor. Where march you, men of Reichland, where carry you halberd and sword, we march to war for our Emperor and Sigmar, our Saviour and Lord. Tomorrow we go to war to face the hordes of chaos. Tomorrow we will be buried in cold graves that await us. And when the fighting is done and the sun goes down at night, Hear my prayers, save my soul, and take me to Sigmar's light. Old Soldier's Song from Reichland Steel Magnus the Pious ensured that the Empire would always have the reliable steel weapons needed to defend the Empire's borders. After his successful campaign to smite the Twelfth Ever Chosen's attack on Kislev and the northern reaches of the Empire, he was crowned emperor and decreed that all provinces must maintain an army at their own expense. Following this, the empire's military might exploded, as many new fortresses and regiments of men were cultivated and maintained. The majority of the martial weapons of the empire included spears, halberds and swords, while the exceptional works of forge mastery were gifted to the empire's mounted knights. We stood with the dwarves as one that day. It was an unspoken code of honour that would not go forgotten. The elderly Chief Ragni of the Jutonis remembers the Battle of Blackfire Pass. Gunpowder When Sigmar proved that humanity would not cower away from the persistence of Chaos's minions, he forged an eternal friendship with the dwarves. With their mountain holds settled in the nearby ranges that embraced the Empire's southern, western and eastern flank, trade was easy and fair between these two peoples. An especially important import for the Empire was the unmatched quality of Dwarven gunpowder, which allowed the provincial armies of humanity to create and train handgunners, mounted outriders and create their own rockets and mortars. Ultimately, the military tactics of the Empire of Man were that of balance. Solid infantry, competent and righteous cavalry, clever bowmen, and destructive artillery assured that the Emperor's arsenal was prepared to manage any threat. That was until the schemes of the Chaos Gods intervened. Balthazar Gelt, supreme patriarch of the Empire's Colleges of Magic, knew that Archon's legions had begun to pour from the fallen polar gates of the north. He considered their advancing march carefully and constructed a grand plan to secure the northern border of the Empire with a great bastion. This bastion was actually the second constructed by Gelt in his lifetime, for when the Empire province of Sylvania fell to the influence of the vampires and their undead servants, 
he successfully conjured a wall of holy warding to imprison all undead within that tainted province. Inspired by the ideas of his minor apprentice, Dieter, he used the relics and icons of faith cast out of the province by the vampire count, Manfred von Karstein, to power the ward as an effective cage for all that was not living and pure. With the tide of that conflict shifting immensely into the favour of the Empire, the Chaos God Sinch took great interest. The god of fate and schemes foresaw great fortune if the vampires were isolated in Sylvania for a time and plotted to use Balthazar's creation against him. Dieter was found some time after with his throat suspiciously torn out. Assuming that it was an act of revenge by the infuriated vampiric aristocracy of Sylvania, Gelt kept on his quest to prove his faith in humanity was steadfast enough to create a second and more powerful bastion against the armies of the north. While he toiled day and night, contemplating great spells with the Colleges of Magic, a mysterious woman approached him with a scroll. Claiming to hold the hidden answer to Gelt's dilemma, the woman disappeared into the night. Unknown to Gelt, this woman was a secret agent of the vampire queen Neferata, and the scroll contained power that Gelt was not yet able to recognize. With few options remaining, Gelt placed tentative faith into this new piece of magic, and in 2524 IC, a great wall of golden light erupted from the ground to draw an impenetrable curtain over the northern front of the empire. From the diseased, ravaged port of Kislev city Erengrad to Rakspire in the World's Edge Mountains, the massive barrier of golden magic required costly maintenance and care by dozens and dozens of priests, in addition to the garrisons of the empire's military led by the Elector Count themselves. Some priests exhausted themselves to death in the maintenance of the Great Wall, and it became clear that the attention required to keep the Auric Bastion standing made it a precarious challenge to maintain, and a large target for the meddling minions of chaos. The Golden Bastion itself was an enchanted living wall of rock. Too steep and smooth to climb, any creature demanding passage would have to physically destroy the wall. However, when damage was inflicted to the stone, the magic of the tending priests would renew the ward and the wall would repair itself before its assailant's eyes. As priests became exhausted or perished in their duty to preserve the wall, minor incursions of Chaos hordes eventually crossed the bastion. The biggest breach resulted in a major battle to test the faith of humanity versus the newly summoned demons of Nurgle at the defense of Aldefen. The initial crash of the battle came as a surprise to Wolfram Hertwig, Elector Count of Ostermark and General of the Defense of Aldefen. At the time, the Count was inspecting the integrity of the Auric Bastion with a brigade at his side, slowly marching east to complete his rounds at Aldefen. Suddenly, the Auric Bastion tore open like a vile wound, as Chaos Warriors and spawns of Chaos God Nurgle erupted from the breach. While Wolfram was not officially assigned to the region as a defender, he ordered the battalion at his command and the garrison of Aldefen to form up and prepare a defensive block while the horde of demons recovered from their explosive entry. Once the Chaos Warriors collected themselves, they sounded a charge up the hill to attempt an assault on the castle's surrounding support. From the western flank, Wolfram raised his Runefang blade as a thousand voices praising Sigmar announced their contesting charge. The swordsmen of the Empire and the warriors of Chaos met in a bloody blitz to compete for control over the mouth of the breach in the wall. Wolfram fought valiantly for hours, but he and his men felt the strain of an outnumbered fight. Eventually, the tide of victory began to sway for the might of the Chaos Warriors, who held the opening of the breach firmly. Before the whole of Wolfram and his battalion had been slaughtered, the Elector Count's bodyguards dragged him from the fight, battered and bloodied. Just when he had accepted his demise at the hands of the laughing, barbaric hordes, the reinforcements of Elector Count Valimir von Raukov, stationed at Castle Rakspire, finally reached the southern front to challenge the victorious but weary Chaos Warriors. Wolfram knew that the Chaos Infantry had reinforcements at their back as well. However, he resolved that if this were truly the end of the world as they knew it, then he and his men would be written into history not as cowards, but as valiant combatants against overwhelming odds, 
with faith, steel, and gunpowder. As the Chaos Warriors reached the bottom of the gentle hill leading to the castle, he arose from his tending bodyguards and unsheathed his rune fang once more. Raising it high for all to witness the unwavering faith in humanity, he led another sundering charge of halberdiers down the hill to stop the advance of Archon's vanguard. For a moment, the war drums of Chaos were silenced by the savage roar of Sigmar's sons. The two armies slammed together, a maelstrom of Chaos's magic tearing through the sky with jagged lightning and groaning wind. Wolfram and his elite but few remaining swordmasters speared through the heart of the front line, parting the rows of black armor like a spear through water. Vengeance burned in Wolfram's heart, so brightly that the Count managed to cut a clear path for the reinforcing halberdiers to race behind and take up Wolfram's rearguard. Upon the hill, a great explosion of smoke and gunpowder from gunmen rang like iron hail deep into the armor of Archon's warriors and ripped through any exposed Chaos soldier. The Chaos warriors faltered under the pressure of Wolfram's clever rebuttal. Masses of dark-armored corpses trailed behind Wolfram's sword, even the armor of hell itself unable to withstand the ancient fury of a rune fang. The blade carved a bloody, mangled path to the general of Chaos's army, Festak Kran. Festak himself was an exalted champion of Nurgle, so much so that the plague god had warped his body into a heavy, sagging hulk of bubonic lesions. With his front line holding long enough to buy their general time, Festak summoned beasts grown in the septic pools of the Chaos Realm. Nurgle's laugh rumbled the crimson sky as a band of plague toads leaped out of fleshy ulcers upon the earth and into the defensive blob of Wolfram's soldiers. The massive beasts lashed their tongues at soldier after soldier with an undying hunger, swallowing their opponents on sight. The ground gained by Wolfram's heroic countercharge was swiftly devoured. Bouncing over the hill with ease, the Plague Toads leapt over anything in their way and climbed onto the battlements of the defending castle, while the Elector Count himself directed his fury towards Festak. Festak's fat body struggled to match Wolfram's agility, the Warlord wildly chopping his great axe down to end the Count. After a severe blow to his shoulder, Wolfram flung himself at Festak, unafraid of death. In this moment, Runefang struck deep into the gut of Festak, who offered a great and boisterous laugh at the Count's attempt. Then, the General cut down the Elector Count with a mighty swing. Festak howled with delight as the remaining soldiers, Castle Raxbyre's hand gunners, were forced to choose between engaging the encircling forces of Chaos Warriors and the Plague Toads slowly climbing their way onto the battlements. The superior warriors of Chaos easily slashed through the gunmen and overran the castle. The Elector Count Valmir von Raukov's limited garrison was trampled by plague frogs and slain by invading Chaos warriors. Even with the might of Valmir's runefang, Brain Wounder, the castle was quickly overrun by the flood of Chaos warriors. Still, the General Festak laughed, until he felt his body begin to fail and crumble. Wolfram's blade still remained deep in the belly of Festak, who was able to shrug off most mortal blows with his thick, bloated body. The rune fang disrupted Chaos's grip upon Festag, who fell to the ground and perished in a long and agonizing death. Wolfram's body lay smiling up to the heavens, while Festag's dark, lifeless gaze raged at the earth beneath his feet. Just as the Chaos warriors had finished toiling for days to take the castle, and minutes after their general had been slain, another army approached. The crimson skies suddenly turned black. Like a thick curtain of night, the magic storm of chaos raging above silenced into nothingness. Then, the black clouds descended from the dark sky. A flock of vampiric fell bats poured in through the windows and swarmed the battlements. The gore-drenched chaos warriors were more than tempting prey for the vampire Count Vlad von Karstein's ambushing army. Vlad's thralls and agents were quick to identify a weak, nearby castle that the vampire lord might wish to take for his own. The Count's mastery of vampiric magic allowed him to transform into a great bat and take flight. Because of this swift method of travel over the forests, Vlad and his swarm of flesh-eating war beasts flew over the mountains and prepared an ambush for the Chaos army 
when they inevitably took the fort. However, when the battle had been won and the occupants of the castle were weak, Vlad von Karstein swooped in and tore the tired Chaos Warriors to shreds silently in the night. While the Vampire Count was feasting upon the blood of the unfortunate army trapped in the castle, a light shone on the horizon to the west. Without a word from their neighboring days about the integrity of the Golden Bastion, an army of reinforcing cavalry and priests rode in from the eastern plains. Led by Vulcan, chosen of Sigmar, and a legendary warrior of the Empire, the company of knights astride white horses rode hard and fast to try to intercept whatever threat compromised the Auric Bastion. The Empire knights formed a spearhead charge into the remaining trickle of demons and warriors from the wall's breach, while Vulcan's legendary warhammer, Galmarez, crushed the persistent but crumbling army of chaos. His armor was impenetrable to the weapons of the Chaos Warriors, and with the speed of his elven steed, Elfandin, the warrior successfully pushed back the tides of chaos with his devastating charge. This allowed the priests of the Auric Bastion more than enough time to magically repair the breach of Gelt's Golden Curtain, and swiftly put an end to the slaughtering and infection of their nearby villages. With no resistance from the castle itself, Vlad von Karstein maintained secret control over the strategic point of defense. The wall now repaired, and with the Vampire Count more than curious to test his own magic and might against the armies of Chaos, Vlad quietly maintained the westernmost portion of the wall, which came to be known as Hellreach. For years, the Golden Bastion sustained breach after breach, much like the defense of Castle Rexpire. However, Vlad's portion of the Uruk Bastion never fell again, despite this area receiving the most frequent assaults out of any of the other Elector Count's support. Balthazar Gelt became suspicious of the frequent and convenient breaches of the Bastion. With the armies of humanity pushing them back every time, Gelt rode throughout the bordering forts and villages along the border of the Golden Wall. He was suspicious of foul play, and set out to reveal what saboteur might be at work. While on his inquisition into his own people, a suspicious informant lured Balthazar to where the Vampire Count would ambush the Patriarch alone and kidnap him to Castle Raxpire. In the dark and crimson rooms of Vlad von Karstein's hold in Raxpire, the Vampire Lord revealed to Gelt that he had been deceived. The Vampire Queen, Neferata, had sent the woman who gave Gelt the scroll to intentionally influence the creation of the spell. Vlad then imparted the secrets of his success to the Supreme Patriarch by giving him a tome of necromantic power, the Vampire Count offering to ally himself with Balthazar against the Northern Chaos armies. In a token of good faith, Vlad von Karstein ensured his minions delivered Gelt safely out of Hellreach. Eventually, Balthazar gave the Vampire's offer consideration, as the years of breach after breach continued on, with each one threatening to overwhelm the Empire's forces entirely. Sure enough, Balthazar opened the tome and unleashed the power within its pages. The earth around the wall cracked and burst with emerging limbs. Zombies of the recently dead and skeletons from graves erupted in legions to defend the wall. Whenever one was slain, the dead would rise again to mindlessly slave for the endless assaults upon the Uruk Bastion. For a short time, Gelt went unnoticed. While he resumed his search for a Chaos agent among the bordering forts of the Bastion, the Elector Count of Stirland heard rumor of Gelt's treachery and rode hard and fast to confront the Supreme Patriarch. Encouraged by Vlad, Balthazar and Count Aldebrand Ludenhoff met on a road leading to Ostermark's border. Before Aldebrand could return the news of Balthazar's use of necromancy, the Count was slain by mysterious circumstances involving the use of Gelt's undead servants. Convinced that there was still a Chaos informant wreaking havoc on his plans, he eagerly took the words of Emil Valgir, the High Priest of Ulric, the Winter Wolf God. Emil convinced Gelt that there was a shapeshifter or changeling of the Chaos God Sinch that was impersonating Vulcan, chosen of Sigmar, the very same general that had defended Castle Raxpire only a few years prior. Vulcan was expected to be at a ceremony where the Emperor, Karl Franz, would be present, and if this were true, Gelt knew the Emperor was in grave, grave danger. Racing against the clock to save the Emperor's life, the Supreme Patriarch beseeched the Emperor to return to safety, 
but in Gelt's exhausted and deranged state, he was afforded no real care to his suspicions. When Karl Franz had had enough of Gelt's request, he ordered the Reichsguard to remove him from the ceremony. Balthazar resisted and attempted to cast magic to halt the oncoming guards. Yet his body was weak from the maintenance of the Golden Bastion, and he cast necromantic spells upon the guards instead. In outrage and concern for the safety of Karl, the court and guards attacked Gelt. In the last effort to complete his duty to Karl Franz, Balthazar raised the dead to defend him as he rushed at Vulten before he could assassinate the Emperor. In the fight that erupted, the High Priest of Ulrich that had informed Balthazar of the plot bellowed out a horrific laugh. The saboteur was within the same order that swore to aid Gelt's Auric Bastion, and it was a changeling demon of Sinch parading as the wolf god's favoured priest. With his service complete to Sinch, he embraced the onslaught of swords and delighted in the promise of ensuring the plan of his master succeeds. Even with the changeling removed from the Auric Bastion's defence, Gelt was forced to flee humanity. Now that the Empire knew of the nature of Gelt's magical feat, the most influential and powerful cult assisting the maintenance of the Golden Bastion abandoned their promise to aid in its defence. Without the immense magical prowess of the Cult of Sigmar, the Bastion was breached so many times that the wall eventually crumbled. Sinch's scheme opened the way for Chaos's army of Glotkin to launch a renewed invasion. Before we explore the beginning of the Empire's end, we must journey into the recent past and go north, deep into the savage territories of Norska. There, a man and his wife sought to combat the northern threats, not with a blade, but with the enlightenment of the wise Ethra and her hard-working husband, Olius Glot. Soon, she would conceive three children in their humble hamlet due to the sorceress of life gracing them with wondrous fertility. Yet this happy conception would not see the birth of three new heroes of man, but the birth of three heralds of doom. Jealous of Ethra's coming children, a hag of Norska quietly pierced the skin of Ethra's finger with a rusted blade, ensuring that her pregnancy would be ripe with suffering and infection. Each night, Ethra would wail and mourn for her unborn, pleading for the protection of her babies from the infection tainting her blood. Unknown to Ethra, there was one willing to listen. Deep in the realm of chaos, the father of plague himself listened intently to the woman's cries. From within his mansion, Nurgle summoned a single small fly messenger to the gravid belly of Ethra. Landing upon her bloated and sickly belly, the mother's fever suddenly vanished, and soon she gave birth to three sons. The overjoyed father named these sons Otto, Etrek, and Gurek, knowing nothing of the vile plans that Nurgle had planted within the lives of his doomed children. The three were born with identical three-lobed birthmarks upon their bodies, a mark of the Chaos God of Plague's promise to care for these three sons of man. For a time they grew older and stronger, aiding their parents in the noble pursuit of guiding the Norsecan tribes to a better way of life. Atrek was the most gifted in study, remaining by the side of his mother even into early adulthood, while Otto and Gurek inherited great physical strength from their father. Despite their efforts to enlighten the tribes, the Norsecan pastime of seaside raiding eventually led to Nordlander retribution, which found the humble homestead of the Glotkin as their target. Autumn came, and over a thousand raiders made landfall into the territories of the fjord-living tribes. The three brothers witnessed the brutal murder of their parents, the spilling of their blood watering the seeds of corruption in the siblings' hearts. In the heart of a hopeless defense of their home, the three exploded with rage and fury, whilst Nurgle's hidden gifts within each of the brothers finally blossomed like fetid foul flowers. Surrounded and outnumbered, the brothers charged into battle without fear of the raiders. Otto wielded the great scythe of his father and cut down hundreds of raiders with the ease of a harvest reaper, his body swelling and mutating into a behemoth of fat flesh. Etrak's magical prowess inherited from his mother twisted into plague magic, dooming his victims into a noxious death by melting them into purulent pools of black slime and commanding maggots to feast upon his foes from the inside out. 
Gurek ravaged the last of the Nordlander infantry, finding his strength potent enough to reach into the torsos of foes and rip their organs out in one great swipe. Pushing the Nordland forces back to the sea, Gurek demonstrated even further martial superiority by lifting a cannon right out of a war machine and clubbing his foes off the cliffs of the bay and into a frozen rocky death in the surf. Brother three shall bring low the empire of man. It is they who will muster the plague kissed in their master's name. It is they who will cast the curse of unbound life, a curse that will bring primal disorder to a world of hard-won progress. United, the lords of disease shall bring the old world to the brink of ruin, ruin from within and from without. All things clean and true shall sicken and fade, the gods of man shall fade with them, until only death holds the key to salvation. These are the end times. Prophecy of the End Times Since then, Nurgle fostered horrible gifts of plague, demonic resilience, and vile tokens of his domain over disease and suffering. Like a grandfather spoiling his grandchildren, Nurgle showered each brother in corruption and power, divorcing them further and further from their humanity. Gurek's body was warped and twisted into something entirely different, a hideous horned monster of mammoth proportions. Horns erupted like spires from his shoulders and head, while his back pulsed with living boils of carefully cultured diseases of Nurgle. His arms bloated with rot, his right hand eventually growing the ever-hungering mouth of a lamprey with innumerable needle teeth. With it he devours his victims alive, leaving larger corpses, even dragons and ogres, infected and rotting so that more children of the god of plagues might find nourishment and fetid bubonic sores to birth new abominations for Nurgle. Etrak, closest to the magical prowess of his mother, embraced the blight of his mind. The memory of his parents' murder twisted his spells into those of bubonic atrocity. Where his mother was able to foster wonderful boons of rich life, Etrak's heart blackened in anguish and warped his inherited magical prowess into powerful sorcery of Nurgle. Truly a master of pestilence and plague, the wizard kept an ever-burning furnace, fueled by the bodies of his dead parents, with him even on the battlefield. Mounting the churning, smoking furnace upon the massively grotesque body of his brother Gurek, the fumes of cremation from the noxious brazier drew swarms of flies and clouds of sickness to fuel Etrak's foul magics. The third brother, Otto, keeping the harvest scythe of his father for himself, embraced his role as the most devoted grandchild of Nurgle. Wounds to his bark-like callous body were allowed to remain open and weep with noxious deadly infection that he would immerse the blade of his scythe in whenever he went into battle. Soldiers that even dared to approach Otto would find that his very body had become a weapon, his entrails that poured from his body like a fleshy waterfall, harboring hungering and virulent ailments just waiting to infect a new victim. Otto, astride the gigantic body of his mutated brother, who was given the new name Gurk by Grandfather Nurgle, would guard Etrak as he summoned spells of pox and rot from the carbuncle brazier grown on Gurk's giant back. The three were one, a revolting union of monstrous strength, powerful sorcery, and steadfast devotion to the chaos god Nurgle. The might of the Glotkin brothers did not go unnoticed by Archon the Ever Chosen. They easily established dominance over the roaming warbands of devotees to Sinch, Slanesh, and even the mightiest worshippers of Khorne. The Glotkin cared not for the favour of the competing chaos gods and humoured the desires of their twisted grandfather Nurgle as any jolly grandchildren might do for their elders. This dedication, however, was a blessing in the eyes of Archon. Summoning them to his throne within the war camps of the Everchosen's vanguard, he offered the most tempting of tasks to the brothers, the promise of the Golden Bastion's destruction and the unchallenged infection of the Empire's entirety. Thousands and thousands of healthy men and women to infect, each one an incubator for Nurgle's new grandchildren. The Glotkin accepted Archon's offer and spearheaded the assault upon the Empire's Golden Bastion. It is here that we return to the present, where Sinch's meddling in politics within the very heart of the Empire ensured that the Golden Bastion fell. Archon's vanguard, 
now accompanied by the ever-eager Glotkin and the plague-riddled armies of Nurgle, pushed through the border of Kislev and invaded the Empire. The plague fleet of Gutrot Spoom, satisfied with the supremely successful maritime siege of Erengrad, sailed along the coast of Ostland, Nordland, and even as far south enough to harass the northern reaches of Bretonnia's territory. Archon's plan to enact glorious ruination upon the Empire involved a simultaneous and carefully calculated strangulation of inland support, while maintaining naval superiority in the Sea of Claws. With the Golden Bastion destroyed, the Glotkin easily raised and infected the weary border counties that had exhausted their resources in the maintenance of the Bastion. Meanwhile, the plague fleet of Gutrot Spoom rendezvous with the Glotkin to combine forces and continue their voyage onto their next target, the greatest trading hub in the Old World and vital line of support to the Empire's capital, Altdorf. The city of Marienburg guarded the barrier islands and marshes formed by the flow of the River Reich using the natural canals to swiftly move goods and vessels between their destinations in the Empire, Fair Bretonnia, and even as far as the High Elven island of Ulthuan. Despite the tentative relations with Altdorf, Marienburg was vital to the prosperity of the heartland of humanity. Thus, to destroy Marienburg, and thereby cut off a critical limb of the Empire, Archon encouraged Gutrot's plague fleet to begin an assault, much like the siege that crippled Kislev's similar trading hub in Erengrad. Late winter 2525 IC, an allied fleet of traders, both local and foreign, prepared their vessels, knowing that somewhere in the Sea of Claws, an armada of chaos and Norsecan warships inched ever closer to their side of the coast. By now, news of the fall of the Auric Bastion had reached the ears of all within the Old World, and the naval warriors sworn to protect the trading hub hoped to catch the encroaching chaos armada off guard. Known for their legendary naval warfare tactics, a fleet of pearly white elven ships sailed confidently out of the barrier islands and west-northwest in a loose formation to sniff out and snuff out the harassing vessels of chaos. Deep into the misty tide they sailed, until their silvery sails and gleaming hulls faded into the fog of the Sea of Claws. Meanwhile, the merchant vessel Meesterhand prepared to sail after the elves, eager to salvage whatever treasures and supplies the elves might leave behind in their interception. Commanded by Captain Nida van Gaal and armed with twelve cannons, the galleon's three sails caught an easy wind in the night to follow the wake of their sister fleet. What they found in the Veil of Mist, however, shocked even the seasoned sailors aboard the Meesterhand. The elvish fleet had been decimated at sunset that evening. Still sinking corpses of broken hulls and shattered timber trash the dark sea. The once glimmering and proud sails of the elven fleet finding a dark and watery grave at the bottom of the cold sea. An armada of plague hulks and Norsecan longships had surrounded the elves with ease and sunk any opposing vessel. Any ship that surrendered was swiftly boarded, their captains murdered, and their sailors corrupted to the will of the Chaos Gods. With Nurgle's favor, Gatrot transformed the remaining vessels into floating cradles of festering disease and barnacled hulls. The Lord of Tentacles, having another glorious victory in the name of the God of Plagues, chased Meesterhand back to the port of Marienburg. Having cleverly outmaneuvered the elvish naval resistance and stolen the rest of the ships for himself, Gutrot's plague fleet arranged their armada to prepare for a massive assault. At the front of the fleet, the dreaded Green Wolf lumbered into range of the Dorvan built Sea Wall. On land, the merchants manned the impressive seawall and stood their ground defiantly. Deep within the port city's marshy dock district, an intrigued set of eyes in the shadows carefully watched the bloody siege unfold. The small merchant fleet that remained in the city sailed out to stall the massive force that threatened their home, but ultimately sank as Gutrot began an enormous attack on the severely outnumbered city. Just as the Green Wolf started a slow advance into the bay, the sea wall suddenly burst with green, mossy life that was slick and cumbersome, as if the very wall had been painted with a thick coat of noxious algae. Partially debilitating the defensive power of the wall, the Green Wolf sailed boldly into the heart of the port to challenge a human fleet flanking the powerful flagship Zegepral. 
Greenwolf's behemoth hull took barrage after barrage of cannonballs, dwarven flame cannons and ballista bolts. Her hull was protected with a cocoon of algae, webbed and woven into open spores that spewed clouds of yellow and green smog. When a cannonball would strike, or a lick of dragonfire graced the glowing green ship, more diabolical magic and disease ensured that the vessel would not sink and give Green Wolf a chance to launch a retaliation from the many catapults and ballistae on her decks. Once Green Wolf had breached the inside of the port, she confidently sailed into Zegapral's defending fleet to dominate the bay. Despite their brave defense against Green Wolf, the mortal sailors quickly fell victim to Nurgle's carefully curated plagues and diseases. The merchant ships were trapped, and as the armada behind Green Wolf's wake invaded the bay and unleashed a hellstorm of cannon fire and plague catapults deep into the barrier islands and crowded streets, Chaos Marauders made landfall from the longboats to raise Marienburg. When the city had become infested with disease and algae, the watchful eyes within the dark corridors of the dock district finally emerged to reveal the true master of Marienburg. Mundvaj the Cruel, a powerful vampire lord that had quietly settled and controlled the poorest and most desperate district, sprung an ambush just as Gutrot's fleet seemed to control the city. The dead merchants, sailors and peasants erupted from the oozing marshes and overwhelmed the surprised chaos warriors on land. From hidden kens, ghostly scythe cavalry and infantry phased through buildings to gleefully chase away their horrified foes. Having seen the tactics of Green Wolf from afar, the Vampire Lord channeled his rage into the summoning of a powerful vampiric terrorgeist, a giant dragon-sized bat with a mouth of sword-like teeth and a piercing scream that cripples even the most ferocious of foes. Known as the Swidok Beast, the vampire and his beloved undead companion launched a counterattack of equally massive proportions. Taking flight high into the sky, smoky with the fumes of war, the terror guys plunged down upon Green Wolf with a mighty scream. Frozen with fear, the infected engineers of the vessel became defenseless prey beneath the claws and fangs of the flying horror. The undead creature, unbothered by the noxious fumes and virulent diseases on board, slammed tooth and claw into the hull and sentenced Green Wolf to a watery, bloody grave in the port. In the streets, the commanding vampire lord slaughtered and feasted on the raiding marauders. Terrified of the endless hordes of undead and the ambushing Vampire Lord, the Marauders retreated to the safety of their vessels, summoning the ire of the Glotkin champions. Mundvard the Cruel called for his flying bestial companion and mounted a charge against the Glotkin trio. Just as the maw of the beast threatened to sink its fangs deep into the fat body of Gurk, Etrak extended his arms and cast a powerful spell that blasted the Terrorgeist with magic that dismounted Mundvard. The vampire, thrown from his seat upon his beloved beast of vampiric power, faced the trio in single combat. Dancing in and out of mesmerizing mist, Mundvard aimed to confuse and overwhelm his opponent as his legions of undead closed in on the champions of Nurgle. Gurk vaulted his lamprey-like arm towards Mundvard and finally caught his slippery foe. With an echoing laugh from his brothers Otto and Etrak, Gurk turned his fat body in land and chucked the Vampire Lord out of Marienburg entirely. Mundvard was catapulted by Gurk so far that he landed somewhere upstream in the River Reich. Without the support from the Vampire's Master of Necromancy, his undead legions crumbled back into lifeless corpses. From the southeast border of the city, a reinforcing army arrived to bolster the defense of the key trading hub. Composed of mostly free company militia, hand gunners and infantry, the Imperial General Aldred van Karreberg ordered his forces to form a defensive block and await the advance of the tired marauders and chaos warriors securing their hold of the Vampire Lord's territory. With the city nearly under total control of the Plague Fleet's might, the weary infantry and war beasts consolidated their strength to the southeastern portion of the city exhausted but determined to defend their newly captured prize. From within the slime-infested streets of Marienburg, a single unnamed and untested Chaos Champion emerged to demand a duel with the Imperial General. Clutching his steel sword tightly and uttering a faithful prayer to Sigmar, 
Aldred clashed against the dark armored champion of Apocalypse. Fate smiled upon Aldred as his blade cut down the champion before his watchful army. Morale within Aldred's companies rallied, and with a roaring cry, the lines of infantry sallied forward to reclaim Marienburg. The handgunners and company militia spread out into the streets to chase away the Chaos Warriors, yet quickly found that their confidence was sorely misplaced. The infestation of algae made the once bustling streets of Marienburg a slippery nightmare of grossly overgrown sea slime. Chaos hounds stalked the militia, pouncing upon any poor soul that lost their footing or became separated from their group. Just as quickly as their morale had peaked, their lives were lost to the clever change in landscape summoned by the Glotkin magics. Then Marienburg was truly lost to the favoured grandchildren of Nurgle. Today we have provided for our father, and he has provided in kind. Witness how his hand shapes as a path to the throat of our prey. This day we have won a great victory, but it is a mere prelude to the glory we shall win in the streets of Altdorf. Gutrot Spoom, Lord of Tentacles The Empire's northern reaches festered with plague, threatening each day to creep closer and closer to the heart of Reichland. With their major bordering port lost to the Plague Fleet, and the River Reich completely unguarded, the Glotkin attained a critical advantage over the Empire. As if this were not damning enough, the Empire's closest ally, Britonia, fell victim to the spreading plagues of Nurgle. Herd stones erupted from the earth all over the Empire, rallying the roaming herds of beastmen into a coordinated force. If there still remained those who denied that these were indeed the end times, they would soon be labelled fools, as their hamlets and towns smoked under the hooves of massive raiding armies of beastmen. And yet still, there were fouler things lurking among the shadows of the south. Rumours spread of red-eyed monsters with razor-sharp teeth and worm-like tails lurking in the sewers and caverns of distant Talea. With time, the rumours would prove true but many would perish just as the secrets of the Under Empire were revealed to them. The Old World was no stranger to monsters in the night. To their southeast, their own tainted county of Sylvania crawls with vampires and their dead servants. Herds of beastmen carve a warpath from deep within the forests, emerging to raid and pillage the underbelly of the Empire. The Glotkin have firmly proven their might at the port of Marienburg, and yet there seems to be no end in sight to the atrocities that will take place before the final curtain of war. Where were the allies of the Sons of Sigmar? Where were the unmatched cavaliers of Fair Britonia to the west? To the south, while the events of the Northern Wars were unfolding, the Empire's conspiracy of silence would be exposed, one tunnel at a time. The knowledge that the entire land, from the wilds of Kislev in the north to the border princes in the south, is riddled and undermined by the burrows of an innumerable foe bent on our utter destruction would cause widespread despair. So, though we know of their existence, for the good of the people, those of us in possession of this dangerous knowledge must remain silent and fight them in secret. Hieronymus Ostwald personal secretary of the Countess Emanuel von Liebwitz. That innumerable, nameless foe was known as Skaven, massive, chittering rat men consumed with verminous hunger. In the end times, these scheming and ruthless creatures wrought international instability through carefully planned assassinations and devastating ambushes. For the Empire, however, there were no Skaven. At least, that's what the politicians said. For the rest of the world, they knew that all tunnels led to Skaven Blight. Below the Arana Mountains, where the highland streams pour into a river delta, a forgotten sunken city housed the sprawling subterranean city of Skaven Blight. Despite the city being the best kept secret in the world, it was also the largest and most densely packed, even among other Skaven holds. The city's exterior, that had managed to resist sinking into the dense marshes and bogs of the delta, became a well-hidden behemoth of defensive authority. Dense, poisonous smog from the swamp blotted out the light of the sun and made travel near impossible. 
Starvation and drowning were common fates among those brave enough to adventure too far into the natural defense. For the few with the misfortune to live long enough and encounter a flotilla of Skaven slaves, they made for easy food for the hordes below. The Lord Sigmar sends me visions of hell. I see gigantic treadmills eternally turning in the dark. I see uncountable masses of swarming vermin standing on their hind legs in a foul parody of man. I see diabolic machines made by deranged mutants. I see bloated queens with atrophied limbs breeding their rotten offspring. All this I see, and in my head the dreadful tolling of the cursed bell still screams. It won't stop. The multitude of red eyes stare at us from the darkness of sewers and graves. They loathe us, and they will rise to devour us for all our sins. Make it stop. Please make it stop. Hieronymus Buscus Skavenblight proper, deep within the bowels of the earth, was a city booming with technological horrors and hordes of ratmen. The underground metropolis is a stinking, perplexing maze of crude architecture framing horrid pits and laboratories. While the slaves from each clan toil away in mines or submit themselves to torture and experimentation, stronger rats that are fit or high enough in status compete in deadly arena games. Even still, the labyrinth of Skavenblight hides nightmarish secrets, twisting dark corridors where Skaven scheme for supremacy among their own race, but more importantly, plan for the final apocalypse of the empires of men. During the end times, the most notable ruling clans were Clan Skya, masters of techno-sorcery, Clan Mulder, genius mutation scientists, Clan Eshin, chiefest of the Skaven's deadliest assassins, Clan Pestilence, devotees of plague and pestilence, Clan Moors, the mightiest of warlords and vermin warriors, Clan Rictus, breeders of strong black-furred warriors, and the Order of the Grey Seers. From each, they provided the Skaven military bodies, magics and machines to ensure their place among the Lords of Decay, the Council of Twelve Rulers of the Under Empire, and interpreters of their God's will, who symbolically claimed the thirteenth seat. While not exalted among the four Chaos Gods, the Great Horned Rat is a similar deity of devastation, given power through the fearful devotion of his Skaven children. He gnaws upon reality with a patient, endless hunger and awaits the day of the Great Ascendancy, when his Skaven children will overrun the world. With each year that passes during the end times, the time seems to creep ever closer. By the time the Skaven executed their first great scheme during the end times, the military of Skavenblight boasted the most horribly advanced machinations in the world. Fueled by the most coveted resource of the Skaven, Warpstone, their weapons of war harnessed the deadly and highly corruptive magic not banished by the vortex the High Elves in Uthwan created so long ago. For the Skaven, Warpstone is even more precious than gold and jewels, for within the queasy green glow of the crystalline substance is the power to mutate, corrupt, and poison anything that comes too close to the material. Of course, that means the refinement of such a resource proved incredibly dangerous, but for Skaven, their numbers are beyond counting, with legions of Skaven slaves breaking their bodies for the purpose of mining this material for their ruthless rulers to meet impossible quotas. With such a powerful resource mined at nightmarish efficiency, their arsenal of artillery and missile infantry were unmatched even by the dwarfs. When the Skaven come out to play, they bring their terrifying machines with them. Rolling into armies of footmen with infernal crushing power is the Doom Wheel, magnum opus of Clan Scryer. Powered by the turning wheel under mutated rats and infused with warpstone, the machine sports automatic warp cannons to the front and side. Designed to incinerate any defense and crush warriors beneath the spiked turning wheel, the Doom Wheel is rightfully storied among the dwarfs as the most terrible chariot to ever grace the battlefield. A smaller sister creation of the Skaven is the Doom Flayer, a motorized metal sphere that deploys massive blades at the front of the wheel to slice through foes like a knife through butter. 
fast and armoured, the iron ball will pierce through enemy lines and avoid most missile fire with ease. For talented rats that had earned the favour of the warlock engineers, they could be assigned to maintain and operate the Under Empire's artillery. The Plague Claw catapults, pestilent contagion and the intensely unstable but fiendishly effective Warp Lightning cannons were the two favoured artillery to bring into siege and field battles alike. Protected by thousands of clan rats and storm vermin infantry, the artillery would tear through defences and monsters alike to carve a noxious path to victory for the Skaven. For an army facing the Skaven during the end times, there were yet more horrors to face. Crafted into bullets and warp fuel, the Ratmen brought death-dealing rattling guns, warp fire throwers, sniping warp lock gisales, and poisoned wind globadiers. If the mass of starving, red-eyed, frenzy of Skaven slaves and clan rats did not overrun the enemy lines, they would be torn and burnt asunder with the weapons operated by the crazed, suicidal Ratmen. Scurrying around them were hellish abominations created in torture labs, assassins and plague priests ripping apart any challenge that might threaten to shut down the lines of weapon teams. While the Empire was distracted with the multi-sided assault upon their nation, the creatures they insisted did not exist began to execute their first of many carefully planned schemes. The Council of Thirteen, after witnessing the failure of the Auric Bastion, launched a precise strike against the southern allies of the Empire, Talea and Estalia. The regions bordering the Talean and Southern Sea were famous for their trading empire and routes to the far regions of Lustria, Nehekara and Uthwan. To destroy these cities would mean the Empire and their allies in Britonia would be boxed in, forced to face the tide of Archon's vanguard and the Skaven invasion at the same time. Thus began the operation known as the Night of 1000 Terrors. From Skavenblight, clan Eshin assassins burrowed deep under the earth and lied in wait beneath the nearby cities. Hundreds of Skaven arrived in secret through sewers and tunnels, their beady red eyes watching as the sun set on the eve of their ascension to the overworld. With the curtain of night falling, the cloaked assassins emerged simultaneously and assassinated the politicians of Talea and Astalia. In a single night, under the concealment of shadows, the Skaven rogues decimated the ruling class and retreated back to the sewers without a trace. As the sun rose the next morning, both nations were horrified to find their leaders lying in their bloodied beds, throats cut without a struggle. In a panic, the nations scrambled to reassemble themselves, pointing fingers at each other, oblivious to the assassins within their sewers. Then the sun set for another night of horrors, starting with Mireliano. With their city's social and governmental stability shaken, the military was on high alert that evening. A massive force of merchant militia stalked the streets of the outer districts of the capital, joined by traders of all nations vested in the success of the city's enormous trading hub. With three companies to the south of the Crab Gate, and two more between them and the Pearl Gate, the city was not truly sleeping. Over the deep canal and the Beggar's Channel, crossbowmen guarded the inner and outer sea walls of Moreliano's two entrances. Over the inner city's bridge, the nobles of men prepared three regiments of mounted pistoliers. Tomorrow, they would ride out to send word to Emperor Karl Franz, and to the southern reaches of Britonia with information of the mass assassinations. To guard the politically devastated capital, the wayward halberdiers of the now leaderless military encircled the most important buildings of the trade hub, whilst Prince Giuliano, a rare survivor of the assassinations, and his remaining servants scrambled to establish control over the city again. The crossbowmen closest to the Crab Gate soon received intel of more Skaven night raids to the nearby villages to the west, near the marshes of the River Delta. Relaying the information to the heart of the capital, the three companies of mounted pistoliers rode northwest, over the two bridges and into the night to investigate the rumour. By soft light of their torches, they revealed an army with 500 red-eyed Skaven pillaging and destroying the surroundings of northwest Miraliano. From that night and for the next six days, the Skaven night runners played cat and mouse with the mounted pistoliers. Their band of raiding assassins whittled down the men one by one, 
cleverly separating their cavaliers one horse at a time into lethally timed snare net slings into the horse's legs. They seemed to dance around the bullets fired at them with demonic speed, taunting and stabbing at their prey as the night runners intentionally ran out the men's spirit and their mount's strength until the entire army had been gutted and feasted upon. Meanwhile, the outer districts of the inner city saw the rise of a deadly infection. The refugees streaming through the crab gate brought with them fevers and poxes. Sightings of giant rats seemed to increase each night after their pistoliers left. The militias patrolling the streets of the outer district soon received an order from Prince Giuliano to coordinate an effort of the extermination of any and all vermin in the city. Four days after the rush of refugees, and ten days after the doomed cavaliers made their journey west, the militia dove underground into sewers and tunnels beneath the city. In the foul maze of filth and water, Skaven gutter runner assassins weaseled around their natural playground and ambushed the militia. Each day, men from the militias would go missing. Straying too far from support or taking a wrong turn, they would fall into a trap of poisoned knives and chittering teeth. The vermin tide, a massive wave of tunnel suffocating rats, would chase away reinforcements just as the gutter runners sprung their trap. For every night the militia hacked through the vermin tide, their numbers thinned. By then, the outer village of Tremaliano had finally fallen to the Skaven. A few survivors managed to flee to the Crab Gate, and all confirmed the stories of giant rat men. For the next week, the outer district sickened with fever. Most of the remaining militia and crossbowmen on the walls had become ill and showed little signs of improvement. Marching rattled the towers of Moraliano. In the west, the night runners folded back into the lines of slaves. Thousands of Skaven slaves rushed at the western canal as a rain of arrows fired upon their hairy backs. From the wall, the crossbowmen struggled through sickness to thin out the horde with volley after volley of arrows. For one night they managed to protect the outer wall. The next night, hundreds more Skaven slaves assaulted the crab gate, piling dirt, trees and debris into the canal. When one Skaven slave would fall to the arrows of the garrison in the gate tower, they would pile their dead into the canal for more filler. Soon, a bridge of death and destruction made way for the hordes to reach the wall. Then the sun set yet again. The toll of a distant bell nears, always ringing out exactly thirteen tones. The prince himself rode from the center district towards the Crab Gate, bringing one hundred men to man Hellstorm rocket artillery to lessen the burden on the crossbowmen. The Skaven slaves reached the gate and climbed over themselves like vicious animals to ascend the wall, slowed by the defenses. Crossbowmen fired down upon the rat men while the rockets from the artillery at their rear screamed over the battlements and bombarded the advancing army with explosive rounds. Boiling oil and tar were poured onto the Skaven, burning the unarmored slaves alive. When dawn came, the army retreated from the victorious shouts of men. Their casualties were thankfully low, but the most worrisome part was that their foe's army did not seem to decrease in number. The Skaven army encircled the outer city's walls by the next evening. The tolling of the bell never ceased, and the forests glowed with an eerie green bloom. There was no assault upon the walls, but the bell tolled and tolled. Under the city, however, an elite regiment of warp fire throwers and poison wind globideers advanced from the undercity and into the sewers. The time bought by the slaves above the surface enabled the gutter runners time to craft a masterful scheme and divide the attention of the crossbowmen and the militia inside. The gutter runners finally abandoned the concealment of the shadows and emerged en masse to confront the sewer guard. As the assassins tussled with the militiamen, the globideers tossed their bombs deep into the sewer pipes to cut off all escape routes to the surface. A poison smog filled the tunnels with a fatal inhalant preventing reinforcements and denying escape. Wearing engineered gas masks, the warp fire throwers marched through the smog unbothered and incinerated all of the remaining militiamen that managed to escape the assassins. With the militia falling swiftly to the Skaven living under the city, 
more bells began to toll. Another wave of Skaven slaves advanced on the walls, carrying ladders. From the armies of Skaven, a line of Warplock Gisele sharpshooters provided long-distance covering fire as the slaves breached the Crab Gate. The Hellstorm rockets were not able to keep up with the sheer numbers of invaders, and eventually became swarmed with Ratmen. The first defense of Moraliano had been annihilated in a carefully executed plan. Prince Giuliano retreated to the central hub of the capital and prepared for the worst. From beyond the wall, Plague Claw catapults fire volleys of their poxed ammunition into the heart of the capital. The inner wall was destroyed just as the Skaven weapon teams emerged from the sewers to begin burning a path into the heart of the capital. Wheeling from the Crab Gate all the way to the new path to the capital's last gate arrived the infamous Warp Lightning Cannon. With a wicked crack, the cannon tore a bolt of Warp Lightning through the heart of the gate, destroying the entrance. The halberdiers were rained upon by poisoned wind globes, effectively preventing any real defense against the coming hordes of rats. Once the Globadiers had captured the entrance, the warp fire throwers entered the cover of the smog again and fired their warp throwers upon the halberdiers and the prince's elite and final few. The halberdiers were incinerated, and as the tolling bell arrived on a rolling battle altar, the prince and his guards were stolen away to Skaven Blight for nightmarish experiments. Mireliano was taken in a siege lasting 31 days. The prince's father, Lorenzo, arrived from the south with an army of merchant mercenaries. Realizing that the riches of Moraliano were now totally destroyed, the merchants departed the defensive initiative and fled for the empire or journeyed south to Lustria. Lorenzo and some of his faithful marched into the marshes to rescue his son and his men from a horrible fate, but were never seen again. The territories of Talea and Astalia were taken days after without the support of Moraliano. Thus, the Skaven were now threatening the border princes, southern Bretonia, the Dwarves, and the Empire. Yet still, after news of the catastrophic siege by Skaven, the Empire refused to acknowledge the existence of the Rat Men. Exploiting this poor choice in judgment, the Under Empire begins a diabolical expansion north gathering support from wayward clans hidden in the mountains, and exploding in population. Meanwhile, Bretonia had now inherited a war front, even while suffering the tides of a bloody civil war. Moreover, the Wood Elves of Athol Lorin stir in the glades between, uneasy at the massive threat to their south and the instability of their Bretonian neighbors. Above all others, Bretonia is the land of heroes. The Kingdom of Britonia. Britonia, much like the history of the Empire, was settled long ago by nomadic tribes of men. The fair plains and verdant forests are protected by the Grey Mountains to the east, the Arana Mountains to the south, and the Great Ocean to the west. In ancient times, the lands of Britonia were occupied by lizard men. Eventually, they were driven out by older wars with chaos, and eventually colonized by the High Elves. After that, the High Elves were driven out by the Dwarfs, which made way for the land to be settled by the nomads of the Bretoni tribe, who would become the fathers of Bretonia. Of course, in the world of Warhammer, peace is never maintained for long. From holds within the mountains, and from traveling warbands, armies of greenskins rallied under the banner of War and sought to shatter the stability of early Bretonia again and claim it for their own. The northern reaches of the realm, Lyonnais, Longui, and Coron, were overrun with hordes of greenskins and pushed the Bretoni tribe deep into the southern regions. When it seemed that the realm was doomed yet again to the inevitability of war, the dragon-slaying hero of Baston rallied the faithful to his sword, preparing a final charge. On the morning of their charge, the cavaliers of Gilles le Breton were bestowed with a vision of a silver maiden arising from a lake of mirror sheen and stillness like glass. From the forest of Chalon, the Lady of the Lake welcomed Gilles and his men to drink from a golden chalice. They drank deeply, and by sublime magic, their bodies were infused with holy courage and strength. Their lances and armor shone like the sun at dawn, and their eyes glimmered with righteous fury. 
Jiel and his men then became the first of the Grail Knights, swearing eternal loyalty to the Lady and leading the counter-offensive against the Greenskins. At the head of a spearhead advance, Jiel led a glorious strike that shattered the armies of the Greenskins. With each victory, they forced their enemies closer and closer to the beaches of the Great Ocean and further unified the tribes under his blessed banner of the Lady. The Orcish legions, trapped between the ocean and the gleaming lances of the Grail Knights, were annihilated on land, and those that managed to escape the Cavaliers drowned in the ocean. For Gilles, this would be the first of his legendary twelve great battles, each vaulting him further and further into fame. In 979 IC, Gilles and his companions officially forged the Kingdom of Bretonia for their tribes to unite under. Only 17 years did Gilles reign, before his mysterious death, leaving his men with a final parting message. In the time of Bretonia's greatest need, when it seems that all hope is gone, I shall return to aid you." Inspired by the tale of Gilles and Grail companions, the military of Bretonia swiftly mastered mounted warfare. Horses, pegasuses, and even hippogriffs joined the knights in battle, and armed peasants and common warriors served as the infantry of larger armies. While some footmen carried bows and arrows, the handguns and cannons seen so frequently in the Empire's forces were scarce. Even Bretonian artillery relied on field trebuchets alone. Despite this, Bretonia's ferocity in battle guaranteed the survival of the kingdom. More than a thousand years later, Bretonia still reigned. During the end times, Luan Lyon Coeur ruled over the thirteen dukedoms, who swore loyalty to the crown, but were largely autonomous in matters of defence. In this age, a promising young Malabord was born, his skill and heroism leading to rumours that he was the bastard son of Luan himself. Earning his spurs in the Border Prince Confederacy, he was confirmed as a Knight of the Realm. To further push himself, Malabord began his journey as a questing knight to seek the favour of the Lady of the Lake and to drink from the Holy Grail. Malabord's list of courageous and bold conquests grew in number. Riding south through the slopes of Massifosal, he exterminated entire valleys worth of greenskins and pushed further east to smite nests of harpies in the Grey Mountains. Even still, he defeated an entire goblin tribe at Axbite Pass and snuffed out cults of chaos in Langui. However, as the Lady seemed to overlook his triumphs, his heart hardened. Lost on his quest for the Lady's blessing, he took rest in the Grail Chapel and sought guidance from the Grail Damsel there. To Malabord, the Grail Damsel revealed to him the meaning of the quest for the Grail. To quest only for the Lady's favour would not grant a knight the right to drink from the Grail, and that the true test of a questing knight was to overcome the very despair that he had attained. The quest, she revealed, was to test the strength of the soul and not the blade, for a knight may slay an entire forest of beasts and still not receive the blessing of the Lady. With this guidance fresh on Malabord's mind, he rose to a place that he knew would test his mettle like no other, his birthplace and the very land of despair itself, Muzion. Muzion was once ruled by a just and even-handed ruler, yet no more. Now the land is blighted, forsaken by the light, and all but the most stalwart residents. Death stalks Muzion, and they call him my lord. Petrus Stavehart, official scribe of the Holy Order of the Templars of Sigmar. Muzion was the poorest and smallest of the dukedoms of Bretonia. In centuries past, it was the location of a heinous act of regicide by the Duke, who drank the blood of the King of Bretonia in front of the Assembly of Nobles. Since then, Muzion has been strangled by the corruptive power of necromancy and mutation. Even the land, plagued by relentless thunderstorms, dangerous swamps, and thick fog. The people of Muzion are typically deformed and suffered from foul diseases, while the nobility were a shadowy council of undead, vampires, and whites. Indeed, Malabord found misery here, and rode out again against a host of undead, where he slaughtered the unliving piecemeal. 
When Malabord came to rest after his latest crusade, he settled his camp near a brackish creek north of the Muzion border in the forest of Arden. Deep in the shadows of the forest, the mist melted beneath rays of pure sunlight and carved a path for Malabord to the shores of a pristine lake. As a golden chalice was raised from the waters, he knew at last that he had found the grail. The knight took the grail and drank from the waters, but he did not shine with the light of valour, nor feel the absence of fear. Malabord became no grail knight, and the denial of his right to the lady's blessings darkened his mind. Madness and fury twisted his soul from devotion to hate for the Lady of the Lake and Britonia as a whole. He cast aside his knighthood and rode for Muzion again to seek death and an end to his misery. Malabord then plotted to overthrow the crown of Britonia. He sought justice for the lies that he had exhausted his life for and schemed to usurp the throne for himself. In the land of despair, he gathered support for a crusade against the king. Even in his abandonment of his loyalty to the lady and the kingdom, Malabord's charm and charisma attracted the courtship of witches and vampires. So devout in his new destiny to bring ruin and retribution, his twisted spirit rallied the dead to his side, walking hordes of corpses aiding him wherever he would ride. Ruthlessly, he subjected the peasants and foreign adventurers to execution and garnered support from forces loyal to the nobles that had agreed to Malabord's sinister plan, who came to be known as the Knights of the Black Grail. Malabord proclaimed himself as the Black Knight and the rightful Duke of Muzion. While he prepares to usurp the throne held by his father and king, Luen Lioncoeur, Sinch saw the growing rift in the nation and exploited Bretonia's weakness. In great rifts in reality, the god of magic and treachery summoned a favoured lord of change to lead an invasion into Bretonia, Kairos Fateweaver. We perceive the infinite. Your past is laid before us, mortal, every sin in plain view. We whisper to the gods, including yours. They know your seditions, due to us. There is no longer hope with them. Your fate dangles on a thread. Let us weave you a new destiny. Stay still, no sudden movements, as we wrap our wings around your soul. Kairos Fate Weaver, Keeper of the Destiny Scrolls The twin-headed Oracle of Sinch was a true master of magic, having spent innumerable years deep in the Well of Eternity, an endless font of infinite magic. He knew every spell, every feat of sorcery and mystical power, yet Kairos was vulnerable to physical attack on the battlefield. Kairos's right head was keenly attuned to the future, while his left knows the past without bias and lies. Yet still, the oracle was blind to the present, as the future would never reveal itself swiftly enough to predict the details of battle. Kairos's supremacy above all others as Sinch's right claw would be tested during a perilous war known as the Year of Woe. 2520 IC marked the Year of Woe and the invasion of Sinch's army into Britonia. Portals from the Chaos Realm tore the sky asunder as a host of flying burning horrors cascaded like raining fire upon the plains of Quenel. Led by Kairos, Sinch's plan was to capture the twelve artifacts once possessed by Gilles Le Breton and the companions themselves for an unknowably devastating scheme upon the mortal plane. Sealed away in sacred tombs and castles, Kairos needed to be swift in abducting the relics so that no momentum was lost before all twelve were in his grasp. In the first month, the Grail Knights in Quenel and low-born warriors sallied out in a blitz to push the demons back to their portals. Kairos took to the sky and summoned arcane fire down upon the knights and peasants alike as his legions secured the first artifact. With the first tomb of the Grail companions raided and the power of the first relic in Fateweaver's claws, the armies of Sinch were bolstered with the arrival of newly summoned demonic infantry. Squealing in high-pitched laughter of pure insanity, the pink horrors of Sinch were unleashed onto the battlefields. Whirling pink tentacles and needle teeth shred the Bretonian footmen into ribbons. 
the laughing demons belched arcane fire from their razor-sharp moors and burned any resisting village to the ground. With each month that passed, Kairos's armies seized an additional artifact. Further and further, the Bretonians retreated north towards Muzion, where the twelfth artifact was held. Only the most courageous dukes attempted to challenge Kairos's armies upon the field, finding that the master of magic and destiny outmatched them in both military might and strategy. The Bretonian castles in the way of Kairos's flight to Muzion were easily crumbled by the sorcery of Sinch, until there was nothing but rubble and black smoke billowing into the swirling skies above as Kairos prepared to siege Muzion, the location of the twelfth and final relic. Sinchi's armies reconvened in the fields to the southeast of Muzior. The city of the damned bore an impressive natural defense of swamps and bogs. The fog was thick, obscuring Kairos's advance in both the air and on land. With an entire year to discern Fate Weaver's plan, Muzior fortified the walls around the lost town and barricaded the bridge quarter to slow the advance of the Pink Horrors. The river Grismarie granted the Bretonians an extra layer of defence from within, the bridges and gates manned by the sickly warriors of Muzion. In the swamps and slopes directly outside the south gate, the knights of Bretonia prepared to defend the final relic with their lives. As the knights prayed to the Lady of the Lake, Sinche's burning horrors erupted from the fog like comets and began a terrifying swooping advance towards the Bretonian knights. However, at the last moment, and when the knights had prepared to die in a losing fight, the most unlikely of allies emerged from the mire. From an engorged ulcer in the swamp, a thick miasma of blackened diseased magic summoned an entirely new host of demons. Nurgle's minions poured out of the fetid portal, led by an infamous Great Unclean One, known as the Kugath Plague Father. For the Chaos God Nurgle, Muzior was a terrific breeding ground for some of his favorite diseases. Nurgle would not see this city and his many creations of pox and filth eradicated, and sent his finest unclean one to lead a surprise defense against his great rival's armies. Enraged and bewildered at this unforeseen change in the present, Kairos and the infantry of Pink Horrors slammed into the defending Nurglings and Plague Father right before the eyes of the Bretonians. Caring not for the infighting between demonic armies, and with prayers to the Lady of the Lake on their lips, the Bretonian cavalry charged into the pandemonium. While the Nurglings and Pink Horrors clobbered each other on land, the skies roared with the buzzing wings of blighted swarmers that harassed Kairos's units of burning horrors above. Kairos dove to the ground in an attack from the sky, striking Kugath's bloated and blistering body. As the Grail Knights cleaved through the demonic infantry with harrowing efficiency, Kugath grounded Kairos by bludgeoning his wings into broken, feathered ruin. Just as Kugath had claimed victory over the Oracle of Sinch, the Bretonian lances arrived at their duel and skewered Plague Father with dozens of blessed lances. With both generals of the demonic armies defeated, the remaining forces of Chaos melted away, leaderless and cowering, back to the Chaos Realm. The eleven stolen relics were taken back, and Bretonia erupted in cries of victory. With the Bretonian kingdom bloodied and battered from Kairos Fateweaver's invasion, King Luan Lianqueur had an opportunity to unite his dukedoms to purge Muzion of the traitors swearing fealty to his disgraced bastard son. He decreed that Bretonia must gather and unite as one in a coordinated force from all sides into Muzion territory. However, as the king was preparing his men in the northern reaches of Bretonia, Duke Armand of Aquitaine and the fey enchantress Morgiana ignored the king's command and rallied an army from the south to march north and confront Malabord. At the edge of the forest of Chalon, Malabord confidently rode out to challenge the first true test of the forces under his banner of rebellion. During this battle, the forest stirred with life as a horde of living wood and forest spirits emerged to aid Duke Armand's army. Dricha, branch wraith and commander of the horde, gave Armand a fighting chance against Malabord's hordes of undead. 
However, as the battle went on, it became clear that the Fey Enchantress had vanished entirely from the battlefield, and without Morgiana's support, Amor's army suffered an embarrassing rout back the way they marched. As mysteriously as Drichar appeared, she and the forest spirits withdrew into the forest as quickly as they came. After the preemptive strike failed, King Luan's Dukes of Carcassonne, Lyonnais and Artois turned their lances against the kingdom and swore allegiance to Malabord. Worse still, it was revealed that Malabord had struck a bargain with an ancient servant of Nagash, the great necromancer. Known as Arkan the Black, his eternal goal remained to revive the great necromancer to his full and divine power and gladly entrusted the hordes of unlife to Malabord. From a line of Bretonian vampires, Malabord was also granted the blood kiss of vampirism and transformed into a blood knight. The Serpent of Musion, as he was now called, began to engulf the remaining loyal dukedoms to the south of Musion, edging ever closer to the deep forests of the realm of the Wood Elves. Within Athel Loren, the elves watched Malabord's Knights of the Black Grail advance past the forests dividing Baston and Quenelle finally having enough of the rampant undead encroaching too close to their territory for comfort. The king of Athel Lorin, Orion, pledged his armies to fight alongside Luan Leoncur's knights at the devastating Battle of Quenelle. From the north, Malabord's rebel army had backed Luan Leoncur's supporters against the river Brienne. Bolstered by necromancy from Arkan the Black, the tireless hordes grew in number from each defiled cairn and tomb of old heroes they encountered on the way. Luan prepared a daring and carefully calculated contesting charge against the Knights of the Black Grail. Patiently, Luan awaited the advancing and confident vampires, ghouls and necromancers. Just as the undead infantry threatened to collide against the Bretonian king's army, a horn sounded from the east. The forest came alive with howling primal energy as living trees marched onto the battlefield to mow down infantry. Above them, a hailing rain of elvish arrows from thousands of glade guard arced over the field and annihilated the first wave of undead. Then, Luar sounded the charge of Bretonian knights from the south, at the same time that wild riders upon great stags erupted from the eastern tree line to flank the undead forces. Forest dragons and great eagles took flight in the sky, sailing over the black line of Malabord's rebels to disrupt Arkan the Black. The ambush by the Wood Elves took a massive toll upon the lesser undead creatures and gave Luan a chance to duel Malabord and end his bloody rebellion. Despite the clever tactics of Wood Elves and the King's Knights, the horde of undead was endless. For each Bretonian knight that was struck down, they were brought to life again by enemy necromancers to butcher their once allies. Ghouls feasted upon remaining footmen, and Arkan's dark magic demolished Luan's tiring cavalry. The king's cavalry charge began to fail, and so did his body. In their duel, Malabord gravely injured King Luan Leoncur, who disappeared in the cacophony of battle. The wood elves retreated to the safety of the forest, and the rebels emerged victorious. With the king presumed dead, Bretonia's faith shattered. Malabord began a march to Caron, declaring himself the rightful king and challenging any duke or knight to prove him wrong. From hundreds of more battles and duels, Malabord emerged victorious, his host of disgraced knights, ghosts and ghouls swallowing up the entirety of Bretonia. With a massive force at his back and few surviving dukes and barons to defend Coran, Malabord prepared to strike the final killing blow to the kingdom. Arrogantly, he confronted the noble few that stood to defend Coran, demanding any and all who dares to defy him face him in single combat. And then, when all hope was lost, and Bretonia was in dire need, a shining knight in green armor answered the call. The Jade Spectre rode from the castle and raced for Malabord. Before the Blood Knight could move, the Phantom Knight cleaved the vampire's head from his shoulders and doomed the rebel army. Without the power of their chief necromancer, and with Arkan the Black long gone onto another task, the undead crumbled back into the earth as corpses. Removing his helmet, the Green Knight revealed himself to the amazed defenders of Koran. The true king has returned. 
Gilles Le Breton sits once more upon the throne of Bretonnia. The Uniter Reborn Given life again by the power of the Lady of the Lake, Gilles Le Breton was crowned King of Bretonnia again. Loire was discovered to be alive, but ceded the crown to Gilles. In return, Gilles awarded Loire the title of High Paladin of Bretonnia. At long last, Bretonnia celebrated a hard-won victory. However, the prophecy of Gilles' return also promised the arrival of Bretonnia's darkest hour, and the kingdom would soon learn of Archon's march of doom through the empire. As plague erupted through the broken kingdom, and warpstone meteors showered into the broken and bloodied fields, Gilles Le Breton declared a final errant war, and announced that the salvation of the world lay in Reichland's survival. Marching south and through Athol Lorraine, Gilles Le Breton rallied the remaining scattered knights and routed packs of beastmen alongside the Wood Elves, leaving a fallen Bretonnia behind. Then they turned north to rendezvous with the Empire. Meanwhile, to the east, in the shadows of Sylvania, the vampire lord Manfred von Karstein prepared a daring ritual to shift the war out of Archon's favour and into his own. This land is my home, my birthright. The wind and rain are my allies. The trees and stones are my foot soldiers. The very earth will rise up against you should you try to take it from me, and my people will feast on your bones. Manfred von Karstein, the Lord of Sylvania. In the years leading up to the end times proper, the vampire Lord Manfred von Karstein had travelled the world seeking out disciples of the first and greatest necromancer Nagash, particularly in the ruined Lamia, an ancient Nehekaran city infamously inhabited by Queen Neferata herself, first of all vampires. In ancient times, when Nagash walked the realms, Neferata disobeyed her father, King Lamiza, and pursued the mortuary cult's goal to obtain eternal life. As a woman, she was forbidden from practicing magic or partaking in priesthood, but despite this, with the discreet aid of the high priest of the cult, she created a modified elixir of life. The first elixir, crafted by Nagash, was derived from human blood and imbued the drinker with immortality and youth. However, because Neferata was not skilled in necromantic magics, she unintentionally botched the original recipe and drank an elixir that transformed her and her followers into the first vampires. Cursed with the eternal, unrelenting thirst for blood, they cast out the original mortuary cult from Lamia and replaced them with their own cult of Nagash, with Neferata ruling from her seat at the Temple of Blood. It was here, among the handmaidens and the eldest vampires in the world, that Manfred's magical prowess sharpened, and he swore a pact with corrupted wraith wizards to aid in the revival of the great necromancer, to bring a new order to the world. With Nagash becoming more like a god than a man in the eyes of his followers, his spirit had become unreachable, even with Manfred's many magics. A powerful ritual, Manfred realized, was required to summon the necromancer, and he set upon the world again to enact a plan of his own. You have read the signs as clearly as I. The growing power of chaos makes no distinction between the living and the dead. Nagash must rise, or our realms of silence will fall, and yours will be the first. Arkan the Black, offering Manfred his unholy pact. Before the civil war in Bretonnia had reached its crescendo, in the west, the High Elves of Ulthuan sent Aliathra, destined heir to the throne of Everqueen, to strengthen diplomatic ties with the dwarves. Manfred, seeking innocent and powerful souls in which to fuel a grand spell of resurrection, conspired with Lichmaster Heinrich Kemmler to capture the princess and sully relations between the two powerful factions. Kemmler manipulated the Greenskins into a sudden surprise attack on the fortress in which the meetings were held, and successfully captured the Everchild within the claws of a terrorgeist, stealing her away to Sylvania, where she would be locked away in preparation for the ritual. The vampire also succeeded in luring the Grand Theogenist, Volkmar the Grim, into a trap, as the Theogenist marched into the western territories of Sylvania to purge the vampires from the Lost County. In his failure, Volkmar was stolen away, just as the Everchild was, to further power the resurrection of Nagash. 
But just as Manfred was to enact another plan to kidnap another innocent and powerful soul, Gelt summoned his first golden bastion around Sylvania, effectively trapping Manfred in his domain for a time as Kislev fell in the north and the Bretonian civil war began. However, the vampire lord soon discovered that his agenda was in step with that of Arkhan the Black, who at the time was assisting Malabord in his bloody crusade against Luan's armies. Arkan, after settling on a truce with Manfred, continued his support of Malabord in the west. During the Duke of Armand's failed rebuke of Malabord's rebellion at the Forest of Chalon, the disappearance of Morgiana the Fey Enchantress was entirely the doing of Arkan and Manfred's convoluted plot. Once in the lands of Sylvania, the everchild Aliathra, Volkmar the Grim, Morgiana, and six other innocent souls were tortured and slain. With the presence of the nine artifacts of Nagash, the necromancer returned to the world, stronger than ever before. I hereby make eternal claim to that which is mine. Sylvania thus secedes from thy petty empire, as do all who dwell within her borders. Mortal or grave-bound, they are mine by feudal law, and let none dispute it. Look to the east, and thou shalt find I have drawn a shroud of night across my rightful realm. In this way I demarc it from thine own lands, where sunlight and hope are still welcome guest. Perhaps I will attend thy yearly feast of words some day, and feast upon thee in turn. Worthless and brief as you are, it would be a mercy. I predict little nourishment and little challenge. For how can the great leaders of the empire protect its borders when they are barely aware of what is taking place under their noses? Letter from Count Manfred von Karstein to the Conclave of States in Altdorf Whether Manfred actually knew what was brewing beneath the sewers of Altdorf or not is unclear, but his insight was correct nonetheless. As the Bretonians emerged from the winding path through Athol-Loren and out of the mountain pass west of Wissenland, Gilles Le Breton and Luan Lyoncourt closed the distance between their cavaliers and the awaiting defence in Altdorf, entirely blind to the seed of destruction planted beneath the capital by Nurgle. A once proud imperial physician, corrupted by the erupting plagues across the empire, stirred his pox cauldron as the attack on Altdorf approached. After having failed to contain and cure the terrible gnashing fever, Dr. Festus, Festus the Leech Lord, locked himself in a deep underground laboratory, desperately trying to do his duty for the Emperor and indeed mankind's survival. Driven mad by the slack-jawed corpses whispering the promise of knowledge and the cure to all plagues, Festus swore himself to the allegiance of Nurgle. In but a moment of feverish nightmare, Nurgle granted Festus visions of every sickness and ailment, his compassion rotting away until the good doctor had nothing more but the twisted desire to breed disease and plague in the name of the Chaos God. With his body mutating and bloating into a hideous behemoth, Festus became an exalted champion of Nurgle and prepared an ambush from right under the nose of the Empire. Erupting in a new fetid birth from the cauldron, Kugath Plaguefather was summoned to the sewers of Altdorf after his supreme victory over Sinch's invasion in Muzion. The day that the Glotkin and Gutrot Spoom's combined forces were to arrive from doomed Marienburg was the Night of Mysteries, or Geheimnisnacht. That night, the accursed green Chaos Moon and smaller twin of Manslieb rose high in the dark night, granting the winds of magic a turbulent and chaotic boost in power. In the Imperial capital, the Emperor was not present in the defending garrison. As a further stroke of bad luck for the Empire, Karl Franz had been presumed dead at the Battle of Heffingen, and Kurt Helborg had been left as the steward of the Empire after Karl's apparent demise. Helborg simultaneously sent couriers bearing desperate pleas for aid as he reinforced the western district of the city, which hosted the Imperial Palace and Colleges of Magic and an easy way into the south portion of the city if the garrison could manage to defend and maintain control of the gate. Luen Lyoncourt, having received word of the oncoming assault from the west, rallied his crusader knights and began a march towards Altdorf. Additionally, Munvaj the Cruel, who was thrown from the Swedok beast in the destruction of Marienburg, was found by Vlad von Karstein upstream on the River Reich to the east of the city. 
Bestowing information to the vampire count on the sheer enormity of Nurgle's forces about to converge on Altdorf, Vlad and Munvard gathered four additional vampires and travelled swiftly into the city of Altdorf. There, out of desperation, Helborg agreed to ally the Imperial forces with the undead. Then, as the winds of magic turned most potent, the vampires raised an enormous host of undead, whose ranks ranged from ancient and long-buried warriors to the recently slain. In addition to the massive garrison of the Regsgard knights defending key points within the sprawling streets of Altdorf, the Imperial engineers manned rocket artillery and the Colleges of Magic supplied priests from the Gold, Light, Jade and Bright orders. To oppose them in the first wave of battle, the Great Chaos Host, led by the Glotkin and Gutrot Spoom, sported an immense horde of Nurglings, Beastmen, Chaos Chariots and even the terrible Torox, a Doom Bull General made of brass and fire, committed to trampling the Empire beneath his cloven hooves. As the Glotkin and Gutrot advanced en masse towards the Western Wall, the Chaos Moon reached the height of its ascension and signaled the start of Festus's trap. From beneath the sewers and under the Temple of Shalya, the goddess of healing and mercy, a putrid green tear in reality summoned the joyful throng led by Festus and Kugath. The buzzing wings of rotflies swarmed the temple and commanded the aerial advantage over the city, whilst plague bearers and stem cutter, a soul grinder of Nurgle, pounced their ambush upon any unlucky defenders to have been caught in their trap. From the great portal, rotting jungles of pox growths exploded in spores and draped Altdorf in a sickly, treacherous landscape. In the south, Leonker ordered his errant knights to sally out in a charge of 100 lances against the advancing Nurglings on the west wall, while he, mounted upon his massive hippogriff, Bikis, and leading 12 Pegasus knights, flew over the southern wall and soared a charge into the swarms of rotflies around the Temple of Shalia. To support the High Paladin's contest, Vlad von Karstein arrived at the temple and slaughtered the Nurglings piecemeal. Swooping down once the skies around the temple were cleared, Luan and Bequis suffered a costly duel with Kugath. With his golden blessed blood pouring from his wounds inflicted by the great unclean one, Kugath melted to his demise under Luan's blessing from the lady. Hanging on to life, still but greatly weakened, Festus then took his chance to end the life of the High Paladin in the name of Nurgle. The Bretonian knight faltered to the leech lord, thrown to the ground from his hippogriff. Smiling still, even in the face of the serrated blade that would decapitate him, Luar perished just as Vlad von Karstein flanked Festus and cleaved his head from his fat shoulders. Securing the temple just as the western walls were breached, Munvard the Cruel summoned the Swedok beast to carry him to the front lines for a rematch against the Glotkin. While the vampire lord stalled the Glotkin, the Emperor was found to be alive and returned to the city from the south. From there, Vlad, Karl and Helborg organized their remaining knights and militia to defend the Imperial Palace at all costs. Hellfire rockets pelted the oncoming armies, as Munvard the Cruel was annihilated in combat by Ethrak's pestilent magic. The Glotkin lumbered through the maze of green hellscape and converged their broken army onto the palace. Vlad and Otto clashed in a bloody blitz of single combat, with the ancient vampire lord easily besting the eldest Glotkin. However, just as Vlad had secured a decisive advantage and the death of Otto for the combined forces of man and undead, he was infected with the foul blood of Nurgle's champion and was forced to resign from battle. Karl led the remaining beastmen and Glotkin deliberately into the heart of the palace, where a stream of fire from the Imperial Dragon immolated the beastmen and supporting Nurglings. Helborg, defending the Emperor, was slain by Otto, who then turned his scythe onto the Emperor and ended Franz's life. Just as the battle seemed to be lost, a glorious golden light enveloped the body of the slain Emperor. Reborn as the host of Sigmar Heldenhammer, Karl Franz became the incarnate of heaven and rallied his men to retreat to the east, abandoning Altdorf to her green, poisoned fate. I have seen the world's demise. More sleep, the accursed orb waxes large, impossibly large. The moon will fall, the oceans will boil, the mountains will break. 
To the stars some will go, but the stars themselves will abandon this world. The scratching beyond the walls can only mean one thing. The vermin are here. It is they that gnaw at the greyed ends of the world. Ceaselessly they plot, tirelessly they agitate. Yet never once do they imagine that they too are puppets, moving upon strings they never envisioned. The worst is still ahead. Prophecy of the End Times For the dwindling remnants of civilization, Morsleib's eerie green glow had yet another final terrible strike upon the world. It was with the hand of the Skaven that this would be achieved, for the Rat Men correctly assumed that the Dark Moon was made entirely out of their most coveted resource, Warpstone. With the Skaven's Great Ascension actively overrunning the world, it became clear to the Council of Thirteen that they needed more Warpstone, more than their legions of slaves were able to mine at once for the Rat Men war machine. And so, while the Empire and Bretonia fled to Averheim following the sacking of Altdorf, Skavenblight plotted to bring the moon to them. In conjunction with their systematic invasion of Talea, Estalia, and the southern mountains beneath the Empire, the Council of Thirteen coordinated a second invasion that would reach all the way into the jungles of Lustria, where the Lizardmen ruled in their temples and pyramids of the Old Ones. Skaven were notorious for infighting and backstabbing, and just as the Council had agreed on the plan to use the moon to their advantage, the Grey Seer clan was ousted from the Council and humiliated by Clan Skyre. Lord Morskitar of Clan Skyre provided a more daring, precise strike against the moon with the creation of a moon shatter, a warpstone rocket built to carry a massive warpstone bomb to shatter Morsleib and rain meteors of raw warpstone onto the planet, simultaneously killing all of Lustria and providing the Skaven with more than enough ammunition to take over the world. However, one Grey Seer schemed to ruin Lord Moskitar's plan, and to reclaim the Grey Seer's power among the dreaded council. Fanqual, elder among his rat kin, and orchestrator of the alliance between Chaos and Skaven in the early days of the End Times, proposed that the Seers might summon the Vermin Lords, demonic manifestations of the Great Horned Rat, into their realm to recover their place in Skavenblight. To his dismay, the other Grey Seers chittered an outburst onto Thanquol, blaming him for all of the troubles and strife the Grey Seers had sustained during their ousting. Stripping Thanquol of his status, he was cast out as an exile and left to rot, while the remaining Grey Seers stole his idea for their own benefits. Through a green tear in reality, the Grey Seers summoned the Vermin Lords. Massive horned rats with whip tails and cloven hooves emerged to grace the presence of the cowering Grey Seers. The Vermin Lords revealed to them the secret to harnessing the Green Moon's power, and as quickly as they scurried into the realm, they vanished with the echoing laughter of the horned rat. Deep in Lustrian territory, and unknown to the Slan Mage priests, Clan Pestilens prepared to emerge from the swamps and forests once Morsleib had been shattered. Heeding the advice of the Vermin Lord demons, the Grey Seers usurped the immense power of the Slan and began to pull the Chaos Moon closer to the world. Some nights the moon would travel miles and miles closer, and other nights it would pulse with crackling, unstable power. Realizing he had been bested by the Grey Seers yet again, Morskatar furiously punished his chief warlock engineer, Ikit Claw, by sending him to the front lines of the wars against the Dwarves hoping to kill him for his lackluster performance. Before elves, before dwarves, before men, the Old Ones arrived upon this world. Then came chaos, and the great plan of the Old Ones was unmade. We are the last of their servants, and only by our hand shall the great plan be restored, with the total defeat of the usurping younger races. Inscription upon the eastern boundary stone of the temple city of Hexoatl. The toad-like sages of the Lizardmen, Slan, eventually detected the ever-nearing moon and challenged the Grey Seers in an arcane struggle. Emptying the geomantic web of all its power, they stopped the moon's advance for a moment to allow their Saurus champions time to defend the Temple of Itza, the first city and greatest of the surviving temple cities. 
the entire continent of Lustria would be torn asunder in the second Skaven invasion, but not without a bloody fight from the Lizardmen, defenders of the world. Before elves, before dwarfs, before men, the Old Ones arrived upon this world. Then came chaos, and the great plan of the Old Ones was unmade. We are the last of their servants, and only by our hand shall the great plan be restored with the total defeat of the usurping younger races. Inscription upon the eastern boundary stone of the temple city of Hexoatl. During the end times, the eldest race played a critical role in preserving their own kind by the time the planet had truly begun to sunder under the pressure of demonic invasion and Skaven interference. Their duty was ancient. Having been spawned from blessed pools in the first primordial jungles by the Old Ones, makers of the now collapsed Polar Gates. While many believed that the rise of chaos made the great plan of the Old Ones now impossible to complete, that did not deter the Lizardmen armies from intervening during the end times. Thus, a massive cosmic battle between Slan Mage priests and Grey Seers overlooked the raging battles in the jungles below. We came upon a small, ruinous platform. On top of this were arrayed a group of skinks and the larger and more ferocious warriors called Saurus. Sat in front of them, on a golden carrying throne, was a creature like a great bloated toad. This I had not expected, though some Norsemen I had questioned back in the Old World had told me that such creatures existed, and were indeed the priests and rulers of the Lizardmen. They were called the Slan. Extract from the Tale of Marco Columbo, circa 1492 IC. From the factions of order, the Lizardmen sport the most physically diverse roster of warriors and roles in their caste-based society. The political and religious leaders were Slan, massive toad-like mage priests that ruled the jungles atop golden ziggurats with powerful magic. While the eldest of their kind were dead or lost to time, the Slan were the descendants of those who had seen the Old Ones with their own eyes. The older the Slan, the more power they were given within their caste. When the Slan mobilized to war, the remaining four core species of Lizardmen served their role within the armies of the defenders of the world. The bulk of Lizardmen footmen were brutish, cold-blooded Saurus warriors. Gifted with natural scaly armor and the ravenous appetite of a carnivore, the Saurus formed the bulk of the infantry and acted as warriors and guardians of Lizardmen temples. Their purpose was warfare and nothing else. For manual labor, the Croxagore was spawned. Standing at a staggering two stories tall and extremely simple-minded, they served as construction workers and hulking berserker warriors on the battlefield. Their spawning was rare and was from the same pool as their comparatively tiny siblings, the fleet-footed and social skinks. The armies of Lustria during the end times even commanded feral carnosaurs or behemoth bastilodons, giving the lizardmen a cold-blooded killing advantage over their enemies in the coming battles. As the green moon drew near and the skies turned red and crackled with impending doom, the lizard men consulted their plaques and stone relics as the greatest invasion on their continent unfolded. I have seen the world's demise. Morslieb, the accursed orb, waxes against crimson skies. Magic rises and reality subsides, leaving only madness in its wake. Vermin cease their gnawing and swarm to the surface, answering their horned master's call. First to fall are the temples of the Old Ones, abandoned by defenders who know that the end draws near. Prophecy of the End Times The cosmic battle between Slan and Grey Seers continued for months, with the moon seeming to creep closer and closer to the planet's surface each day. One by one, the Slan slowly fell into a comatose state as they exhausted themselves, giving the Skaven Grey Seers an increasing advantage over the Lizardmen. They continued to fall until only the oldest and most powerful Slan, the Lord of the Solar City, Mazda Mundi, remained to contest the Ratmen Seers. As the power of the Slan waned, 
warpstone meteors broke off from the green moon and hailed upon the jungles with explosive, fiery destruction. Before Lord Mastamundi slipped into a deep sleep, he expended all his cosmic power to limit the blast caused by the oncoming impacts. Then the moon stopped growing in the sky, and the power of the Grey Seers seemed to falter simultaneously. Grey Seer Thanqual had promised all his former clanmates' warpstone horde to Eshin, in exchange for cementing himself as the chiefest Grey Seer. As Thanqual succeeded in his scheme, the meteor impact upon the planet summoned a titanic chittering from the earth below Lustria. An explosion ruptured the brass bell deep in the Temple of the Horned Rat. The very same rat that had expunged the mastermind of the plan to crash the moon to Lustria were suddenly assassinated by Clan Eshin Knight Runners, their throats cut and their tails sliced from their bodies. Seeking to reclaim their realm of old, Clan Pestilens attempted to reconquer the temple city of Quetzal in the imperial year of 2489 IC. The plague monks emerged with such numbers and deployed so many plague furnaces that swaths of the jungle were covered in pestilent mist. The unnatural cloud could be seen for miles, rising like a thunderhead above the canopy. Only an untimely meteor strike prevented what was sure to be a victory for the pestilent rat host. Accounts of the Battle of the Mist, circa 2489 IC. In a sea of living fur, thousands upon thousands of ratmen erupted from the earth like a fat, verminous boil. The mass tunneling to the surface was led by Plague Lord Kriegix of Clan Pestilence, commanding legions of slaves and plague monks toward the surface. Raiding the jungles with their uncountable numbers, Kriegix's armies carved a warpath towards Tlaxlan, the city of the moon. Saurus warriors emerged from their guarded temples, and skinks hunted the ratmen unseen in the jungle. The lizardmen lacked siege weapons, however, and combined with the sudden eruption into Lustrian territory, the temple city saw a harrowingly fast advance through their defenses. Breached in 12 locations, the Skaven hordes pursued the temple guardians into the centermost pyramid and captured two slan mage priests. Carrying them to the top of the pyramid, chanting and chittering, they devoured the priests alive and sent a clear message to the retreating lizardmen. As the lizardmen retreated, their commander, Lord Axcha, secured the escape of the slan lord Tetueko. In the chaos of the retreat from Telaxtlan, the slan reached his toady finger up to the sky and ensnared a passing comet with the last of his power. Just as the temple city fell beneath the legion of rats, the comet finally collided with the city, sending a shockwave of fire and destruction across miles and miles of jungle. To the lizardmen, it was better to eradicate the temple and its inhabitants than to allow the Skaven to defile and usurp relics of the Old Ones. Then, with the first portion of the invasion broken by the meteor, the lizardmen retreated to Itza, the first city, to participate in one of the bloodiest battles in End Times history. Led by the great potentate of Pustulates, Plague Lord Gritch, and the newly appointed Plague Lord Grillock, 10,000 Skaven slaves swarmed Itza from all sides. Learning from the failure in Telaxlan, the Plague Lords devised a plan to isolate the defending Itza armies and infect the Temple Guardians with nasty viruses and diseases. With the whips crack and the dreaded bells tolling, the slaves dug a moat of behemoth proportions around the capital of the Lizardmen Empire. The garrison was led by Texa, who had been given charge of Itza's protection, while the mighty Saurus warlord Croc Gar led a defense in the neighboring Zwahotek. No armies nor invasion on the continent could outnumber the enormity of Skaven and Lizardmen soldiers in number at Itza. While the slaves dug, skirmisher night runners pillaged the surrounding settlements. Gutting their inhabitants overnight, they occupied the land and secured a foothold within the Lustrian jungle. However, the night runners were harassed every night by feral carnosaurs coming to satiate their hunger for warm blood flesh. 
Skink skirmishers fired silent blow darts through windows and alleys, and carried off their prey to the canopy to eat the rat men alive. As the sun rose over the temple, Pterodon riders commanded the skies over Itza and flew from Skavenhold to Skavenhold to drop boulders over Skaven encampments. The Pterodon riders chased away the skirmishers just as reinforcements for Clan Pestilence, the Contagion Conclave, arrived. The virulent batteries were wheeled into firing range of Itza's outer shell. The Plague Claw catapults carried ammunition of infections like Red Pox, Seeping Pox, Scalamundrax, and the Oozing Eye Plague. On their flanks, the infamous Acolytes of the Green Festers, the Cankerous Choir, and the Rot Claws chitter hungrily at the city they were infecting. After the Pterodon Riders had regrouped, they brought another wave of falling rocks and blow darts to destroy the virulent batteries. However, for each destroyed siege engine, the innumerable horde of Skaven slaves pieced the weapon back together to continue launching more terrible sickness into the temple. The Lizardmen cohorts began to perish at an alarming rate, and Texa was forced to order his temple guardians to fall back to the heart of Itza and out of artillery range. The Skaven closed in to what they thought was a victory, until a sudden crack of crimson lightning sundered the cloudy sky above. The jungle stirred with the thunder of an approaching army. The prophet of Sotek, a god of war and serpents, advanced on the rearguard of the Contagion Conclave. Croxigore berserkers, red skink warriors of the Red Shields, and the chameleon sharpshooters of the Eyes of the Canopy led the slaughter of thousands of slaves and plague monks. Behind them, fire-breathing lizards, titanic bastilodons, and raptor cavalry swept forward and pushed the Skaven back against their created moat. As the rain fell, the moat turned into a bloody quagmire and swallowed the hordes backed against the pit. The elite regiments of the Skaven were slaughtered mere moments after the first charge, totaling all semblance of Skaven leadership. The rivers and streams ran red with the blood of a nearly instantaneous genocide as Clan Pestilens succumbed to a mass rout. With Itza still standing, the final limb of the Skaven attack on Lustria was repelled. Skaven warlock engineers employed optics at the City of Mist to sense the defending lizardmen concealed within the foggy defences. Lord Hua Hua was discovered by Lord Glistrox in the Temple of Infinite Circuits and torn apart by plague monks. The Skaven quickly overran the second city without the Slan's conjured mist to defend it. However, as Clan Pestilence took Slanthrapeg, the armies of Croc Gar responded to a plea from the city for aid and annihilated the surprised Skaven invaders. The apocalyptic struggle between Skaven and Lizardmen engulfed all reaches of Lustria and even places beyond. The Lizardmen, led by Lord Mazdamundi and Venerable Lord Croak, the first of the Slan, gathered at the solar chambers of Itza to offer a final grand act of defiance against the apocalypse. Mazdamundi sacrificed himself to expend whatever was left of his cosmic power to stop the falling moon finally but was unable to prevent a portion of Morslieb from crashing down into the planet. Lord Croak, having watched his pupil perish for the world, summoned the greatest magic of the Slan, the Shield of the Old Ones. A magical dome shielded the world outside of Lustria from the wall of fire that annihilated the continent at the price of Croak's life. As the two Slan sacrificed themselves to save the world for the moment, the pyramids of the Lizardmen took to the sky like floating fortresses. The Slan returned to the stars, leaving behind the remaining Lizardmen to see the end of the fated place through. Just as the continent of Lustria was unable to remain untouched by the apocalypse, further north to Nagaroth and Ulthuan, an invasion of Khorne marched under the bloody banner of Valkyr the Bloody. Her bloodied horde descended from the north surprising the unprepared patrols and defences. It was only when rare survivors of the demonic attacks finally arrived at the Tower of Volroth that the realm of the Witch King was alerted to the renewed chaos invasion into the realm.
If they shall not bow to me, the rightful ruler of Ulthuan, then I shall see each tower crumble and every soul scourged in pain until they beg for my rule. Malekith, Witch King of Nagaroth The Witch King, or Malekith by name, was born the son of Inarion the Defender, hero of elves during the ancient invasions of chaos. However, when Malekith tried to claim Ulthuan for himself through cruel bloodshed, the flames of Asurian, which were said to spare only the true heir of the Phoenix King from a burning death, left the prince near death and denied the Witch King his birthright. Taken to safety by his sorceress mother, Marathi, Malekith's burned body was encased within a suit of magical black armor, his brow crowned with a jagged black helmet. Assuming a persona of revenge and destruction, he sought to reclaim Ulthuan even as the end times drew near. Once alerted to Valkyr's advance, Malekith's fortresses and raiders prepared to engage the demons of Khorne. Foolishly, and characteristically in line with Dark Elven pride and avarice, Malekith's armies stood alone during each wave of the invasion. As their short-sightedness was exposed through the raising of Clark Karend, the northeastern cities of Nagaroth finally agreed to coordinate. Lokir Felhart's war fleets sailed out to challenge the Norskan longships, but could not stem the tide of vessels or prevent the landfall of marauders. If that were not damning enough for Karend Kar's defense, an entire army of Skaven erupted from catacombs at the time of landfall and tore the city to shreds between three different armies. With a bloody, efficient swiftness worthy of Khorne, three of Nagaroth's six cities were taken. Supremely annoyed by the pressure from the northern fronts, Malekith was forced to delay his intended invasion into Ulthuan and focus all his efforts on preserving his remaining holds. In Ulthuan, the High Elves suffered their own losses to the demonic hordes. Refusing to lead the defense, Phoenix King Finubar isolated himself in his tower and came to the revelation that he and the kings before him were impostors, rulers who had cheated death from the flames of Assyrian through magical protection. The Witch King, projecting his spirit into the Phoenix King's observatory, taunted Finubar's lamentations and summoned a blood-letter demon of corn into the tower. Finubar, in his despair, allowed the demon to kill him in an act of suicide. The Witch King, atop the great black dragon Seraphon, pushed the armies of Chaos back north, clawing miles of territory back into Dark Elven control until the bloodied horde had reached the gates of Nagaroth. By now, much of Nagaroth was in ruin, and the planned invasion into Ulthuan was becoming increasingly impossible. It was here that Malekith's mother made him face the facts. With the true end times near, Marathi warned that pursuing the path of the Phoenix King would destroy all that had made him her son. Refusing to heed this warning, and with pride in his heart, Malekith abandoned his mother to summon all that were still faithful to the Witch King's call. Without his support, his kingdom burned behind the Black Arks as they sailed for one last invasion into Ulthuan. We will never forget that which has been taken from us. Ulthuan belongs to me. If it takes a thousand years, ten thousand years, I will claim my rightful place as king. I am the son of Anerion. It is my destiny. Malekith, Witch King of Nagaroth in the early history of the Warhammer world, Ulthuan and the Asur, or High Elves, were responsible for creating the Great Vortex within the Inner Sea. Since then, that vortex had faithfully siphoned the excess magic from the catastrophic failure of the Polar Gates made by the Old Ones. The Isle of Ulthuan itself was a hollow ring, protecting the Great Vortex via the ten High Elven kingdoms which encircled it. Each of these kingdoms was ruled by its own High Elf Prince or Princess, and each province commanded their own armies and had its own strategies to deal with both foreign and domestic threats. Proof of the continent's eternal turmoil with the Dark Elves could be found in the north and east of the continent, the coasts sunken beneath the waves. While the continent was host to eternal turmoil, it was also the home of the world's remaining dragons, which would play a shocking role in the coming invasion. 
With the service of this bound demon, we shall be able to move so swiftly that our enemies will not know where we are or how to stop us before it is too late. We will be able to amass our forces to overwhelm our enemies before they know what has hit them. This, more than anything else, will give us a victory. This time all of Ulthuan will be ours. This time we will succeed. This time victory is inevitable. Witch King Malekith enacting the invasion of Ulthuan. Malekith's invasion into Ulthuan began from the west, led by Lokir Felhart, a dark elf corsair of noble birth. The seasoned captain of the dark elven fleets emerged from the mists of a dark storm and surprised the high elven patrol vessels that guarded the seas west of Tyrannoc. Prince Morvai, returning from another battle, desperately rallied his kingdom and countered Felhart's assault with an armada of his own. Yet, as Morvai's fleets chased Felhart's squadrons away from the broken coastline, they fell into a masterfully laid trap. Thousands of High Elves were lost in the maritime skirmish, and Morvai himself succumbed to the poison of a carefully placed assassin's blade. The prince was laid to rest, and with many of Tyrannoch's warriors distracted by Lokia's retreat, the true assault began at the battle for Eagle Gate. The garrison at Eagle Gate, led by Prince Ivan, had suffered catastrophic damage during the previous Wars of Reclamation. Six of the eight walls had been breached, still unrepaired by the time the Dark Elven armies approached from the north. Moreover, the famed twins, Lawmaster Teclis and Prince Tyrion, could not contribute to the Redoubt's defense, for they were across the world, attempting to free Eliathra the Everchild from the terrible ritual to revive Nagash. On the other side, the Knights of Hag Grave were led by Malice Darkblade. Malice had been given the honor of leading the land invasion, for his own body hosted the slanish demon Sir Arkan, drinker of worlds. Since these dread knights had no time to prepare siege weapons, they made a reckless charge towards the six breached walls of the Eagle Gate. A rain of high elven arrows pelted the advancing army from the walls, preventing Malice's forces from erecting suitable war machines to challenge the garrisoned gate guards. Thinning the Dark Elven infantry successfully, Malice was forced to retreat north and prepare a second advance. The ruthless Dark Elven leader announced that any of his knights that dared to disobey coming orders would be executed. The next night, Malice's armies rushed the gates again, but the Dark Elves still could not make any real progress towards capturing the stronghold. The field before the Eagle Gate was bloodied with thousands of Dark Elven bodies, but the High Elves suffered minimal casualties. Enraged by the ineffectiveness of his assault, Malice was forced to call upon his reserves, the Knights of the Burning Dark, the household knights of Malice himself, who were mounted upon speeding, cold-blooded raptors. The knights joined Darkblade's side and tried to force their way through the breached walls faster than the Eagle Gate garrison could fend them off. However, the time squandered by Malice had allowed reinforcements to arrive at the Eagle Gate. To challenge the cavalry charging the Eagle Gate, Tracian hunters and Illyrian knights rode out of the breached gates with Prince Ivan and crashed into Malice's reserve just outside of the stronghold. High above the clouds, high elven phoenixes dove down onto the dark elven infantry and began burning a path for the high elven reinforcements towards the rearguard of Malice's armies. The dark elven invasion was brought to a decisive halt. Unable to contain his rage, Malice succumbed to the Slanesh demon hosted within his blade. Exploding with renewed demonic power, the Dark Elf warrior submitted himself entirely to the whims of the demon within, slaughtering friend and foe as he carved a bloody path to Prince Ivan. The two clashed as their armies surrounded their flanks. Suddenly, the High Elven Prince was beheaded by Za'arkan's demonic claws, causing a change in the tide of battle which finally forced the High Elves to rout and retreat back to the safety of the battered stronghold. Even still, the Dark Elven rearguard was suddenly smashed into by silver chariots, heralding what was thought to be the final repulsion of the Witch King's invasion. Then, more forces arrived. The famed dragons of Kalidor blotted the blue sky above. The High Elves of Eagle Gate looked up in awe at the reinforcements summoned to their side. Their awe quickly turned to horror, however, 
as the beasts unleashed a carpet of dragonfire not upon the Dark Elves, but upon their own kind. Kalidor had betrayed the other nine High Elven kingdoms, and at this moment, Eagle Gate was seized by the dragons, which secured the victory of the Witch King's armies. The cycle of history repeats itself, much to the Dark God's merriment. We approach the hour of the last phoenix, when only Assyrian's fading power can save us from thirsting Cain. The fate of the Elves now relies upon two realms, one doomed to perish in fire and slaughter, and one that shall endure whilst I have strength to defend it. Mortals shall assume divine roles, the heirs of Anarion will fight the final battle, and the accursed Widowmaker shall be freed from its prison of stone. Prophecy of the End Times All of Ulthuan was shocked by the revelation of Kalidor's betrayal. As the survivors fled the Eagle Gate, the dragons perched themselves atop a nearby mountain, unable to bring themselves to slaughter their own as they escaped to the princedoms still loyal to the Phoenix King. A secret agent of Marathi, the Witch King's mother, was quietly sent to Malice during the chaos of the war, and banished the Demon of Slanesh back into Malice's blade to restore his senses. Once his mind and body were under his control again, Malice ordered his remaining soldiers to secure control of the Eagle Gate. Here the Witch King arrived to plot the second phase of his invasion into Ulthuan. Malekith, Lawmaster Teclis, and Imric, Prince of Kalidor and Lord of Dragons, met at the stronghold to discuss their next steps. The Lawmaster made great strides to convince Malekith that the proof of the true end times was undeniable, and that the preservation of their race lay in the affirmation that the Witch King was the true heir of Anarion the Defender, first of the Phoenix Kings. While his own twin brother plotted against Ulthuan with Malekith, Tyrion, the greatest living High Elven warrior and long-assumed heir of Anarion, returned to Ulthuan. After failing to save Eliathra from Manfred's ritual to revive Nagash, Tyrion demanded that the Phoenix King explain Kalidor's betrayal. Marching into the King's quarters, Tyrion discovered, to his horror, that the Phoenix monarch had committed suicide. The violent evidence of Finnebar's death was plastered on the walls, the bloodletter demon summoned by Malekith nowhere to be seen. Finnebar's bloodied remains were gathered at the Sea of Dreams for a funeral. The Phoenix King was buried at sea, and Tyrion was elected unanimously by the remaining faithful princedoms as Regent of Ulthuan. In his first act as Regent, Tyrion imprisoned the Caledorian princes for their betrayal of the homeland, and called for a counter-offensive against Malekith and the occupied Eagle Gate. However, the High Elven Council pleaded with Tyrion to reconsider as the death of two rulers in the same year would certainly crush the morale of the entire isle. With neither family nor friends at his side, Tyrion continued to rally any elf still loyal to Ulthuan, and soon he slowly felt the corruption of power overcoming him. After the first month of Tyrion's regency, rumours poured in of Malekith's next move. Widowmaker, the Sword of Cain, a weapon storied to be the weapon belonging to the elven god of war, was the Witch King's next target. Seizing it would grant Malekith the murderous power of the Widowmaker, but the weapon itself was embedded in the Blighted Isle to the far north. A race between Malekith and Tyrion ensued, each rushing to the blade in an attempt to deprive the other of its ancient power. Ignoring the cries for reconsideration from his council, Teclis gathered an army for himself and made for the Blighted Isle. Malekith's armies advanced over the mountains, with Teclis emphasizing that Tyrion mustn't be allowed to seize the Widowmaker, even if it meant that the weapon would instead fall into the Witch King's hands. Simultaneously arriving at the shores of the Blighted Isle, the armies of Malekith and Tyrion collided in a bloody blitz. The two elven warriors raced to the blade, prepared to kill the other for the strength sealed within. Mad with power, and broken by the betrayal of his own brother and the Dragon Lord, Tyrion claimed the Sword of Cain and proclaimed himself the ruler of all Ulthuan. Malekith's own mother pledged support for Tyrion, and all of Ulthuan and Nagaroth split their true loyalties between the true Phoenix King and the Avatar of Cain. Warning Malekith, Teclis advised the Dark Elven King that the only hope of victory over his brother and the Dark Gods was the unravelling of the Vortex. 
By unbinding the winds of magic and sealing one within Malekith, Teclis hopes to make the king equal in power to the gods themselves. Yet Malekith was cautious, having only just recently claimed the phoenix throne for himself as the rightful heir. Everqueen Ilariel denied Tyrion, refusing to be the Everqueen of a tyrant, thereby gutting his legitimate right as the new phoenix king. In yet another gut punch to Tyrion's position, Ilariel secured the support of the Wood Elves for Malekith, just as the final hours of Ulthuan were upon them. In the chaos of political turmoil, thousands of Elves perished in the following conflicts to control the Vortex. Eventually, the unified forces of the Dark, High and Wood Elves secured victory over Tyrion's faithful. The Vortex unraveled, the Wood Elven King Orion was killed by Tyrion in the ensuing battle, and in the absence of the Vortex, the entire Isle of Ulthuan sank into the sea. With the Eight Winds unbound, Malekith absorbed the Wind of Ulgu to become the Incarnate of Assyrian, and Tyrion absorbed the Wind of Hish to become the Incarnate of Cain. In the realms of men, Karl Franz absorbed the Wind of Azir to become the Incarnate of Sigmar during the battle for Altdorf. Malekith, the true Phoenix King, with his ever-queen Alariel and the remaining Elves, escaped the Doomed Isle through the world routes to Athel Loren, where the Eternity King reigned until the final days of the End Times. Everything I see is mine. All the other bits are mine too. I just ain't got there yet. When we reach the end of the whole world, we'll turn around and march back. Grimgor Ironhide, Black Orc Warboss. While the winds of magic escape the broken vortex and the sinking High Elven Island, the wind of Gur sails far to the east, binding to the green skin responsible for the biggest war the Warhammer world had ever seen. Grimgor Ironhide, renowned by his kind as the Green Slaughterer, rampaged east after his embarrassing defeat at the hands of Vardek Krom in the early invasion of Kislev. Empowered by the Wind of Gur and attracting the attention of the Great Green Prophet, the Greenskins would prove an unlikely ally against the descending armies of Chaos. A grin split Grimgor's grotesque features as he recalled how the Stunties had wailed as he'd torn down their city of pillars and pits, freed their slaves, and toppled their statues. That'd teach them to break their staves on his hide. That'd teach them to try to make Grimgor a slave. The grin faded, and the old anger came back, hotter and fiercer than any stunty fire pit. Grimgor Ironhide, recalling his true origins. Before Grimgor was recognized as the most infamous Greenskin warlord, he was one among the thousands of slaves serving the ruthless Chaos Dwarfs, a forgotten throng of mountain men steeped in the horrors of the first Chaos incursion when the ancient Polar Gates fell. Forced to survive after being cut off from their Dwarven allies in the west, the ancient wars of Chaos changed them in dreadful ways. The Chaos Dwarfs abandoned the traditional ancestor gods of their kin, and embrace the bull-like minor chaos god Hashut, and with it the greed, the tyranny, and the demonic fire that Hashut demanded in worship. In massive, sleepless factories spewing black smoke above the dark lands, the chaos dwarves force thousands of goblins and orcs into hard labor. From this dismal, hopeless reality, Grimgor would emerge as one of the first black orcs, and find the freedom to do what he loved most, wage glorious war. Where then do they come from, these iron savages who frighten other orcs into awestruck obedience, these black orcs? That is a grim tale best suited for long winter nights, but I will impart the substance of it. Long ago, the fell chaos kindred of the dwarves needed a steady source of reliable troops. The greenskin races that they had to deal with at the time, they deemed less than adequate. So using their sorcery and a carefully applied breeding program, they set about creating a new strain of orc. They sought to make them stronger, hardier, and more intelligent, that they could better carry out the will of the Chaos Dwarves. They succeeded far beyond their expectations and desires. Voldemar, Scholar of Nuln The ill-fated experiment of the Chaos Dwarves to create better slaves succeeded only in making perfect leaders for the enslaved to rise up and break the shackles that bound them to their cruel masters. 
Only by the betrayal of the treacherous hobgoblins were the Chaos Dwarfs spared total destruction at the axes of the Black Orcs. And once the rebellion had allowed countless slaves to escape, the Dwarves swiftly re-established control over their mines, armories and factories. Emerging with his life along with a contingent of exhausted and hungry Black Orc bodyguards, known as the Immortals, Grimgor wasted no time marching north to the World's Edge Mountains to take over tribes of Greenskins and carve out a small empire for himself. Through battles with Kislev, Skaven and the Dwarves, Grimgor established himself as the Green Slaughterer and the Alpha Orc. That's right, I ain't never not won before, but I still ain't been beat. Grimgor after fighting the Northmen of Vardek Krom. During the early years of the Chaos invasion into Kislev, Grimgor eventually suffered an embarrassing defeat at the hands of Vardek Krom. In the aftermath and his enraged march east, his goal was to redeem himself in the eyes of the green-skinned god of brutal cunning Gork. Rampaging east, Grimgor's boys encountered and annihilated the next Snapper tribe in the World's Edge Mountains. The survivors of the tribe quickly pledged allegiance to the Green Slaughterer, further swelling Grimgor's numbers. Pushing even further east, the Hobgoblin tribes of the Eastern Steppes were next to succumb to the massive tide of Greenskins. The more Grimgor conquered, the enormity of his already massive army continued to grow. Orcs poured in from all over the world to take part in the glorious war, and just as Grimgor's power and authority seemed to peak, his body was infused with the wind of beasts as the far-off vortex collapsed. Invigorated as the incarnate of Gur, the war boss dared to confront the tyrant of the Ogre Kingdoms, Greasus Goldtooth. By his formal title, Trade Lord Greasus Tribe Stealer Drake Crush Gate Crusher Horde Master Goldtooth the Shockingly Obese, the Ogre Tyrant, was a perfect challenge for Grimgor to prove himself as the best. Claiming that he was too rich to walk, Greasus's living throne of goblins carried the unbelievably fat warlord to Grimgor. Terribly vain, the Ogre would not submit to Grimgor easily. However, Grimgor secured the support of the Ogre Kingdoms by clubbing Goldtooth's head in with his own scepter. Through this display, the Ogres believed Grimgor was the living avatar of the ever-hungering Great Maw, a great crater created in ancient times that bore innumerable spikes to give the illusion of a gaping toothy mouth. Seeing Grimgor's insatiable hunger for war and glory, the Black Orc warboss commanded the following of the Ogres and continued his terrible warpath even further east to the verdant lands of Cathay. As he lay siege to the Empire of Cathay, he attracted the attention of the prophet of the Greenskin Gods, Wurzag ud Ura Zahuba. Wurzag is beholden to no tribe nor lord, only the whisperings of the Greenskin Gods in his adult mind. Wurzag. It was Wurzag's dream to find the one great war boss that would conquer the world by claiming both the twin gods Gork of brutal cunning and Mork of cunning brutality. By the light of the fire in each encampment he visited in the east, Wurzag performed shamanistic dances in search of clear signs of the orc that would embody the will of both gods. After weeks of pondering visions, the prophet had realized that the war boss he sought would come to him not in one form, but two the Fist of Gork and the Hand of Mork. Deeming Grimgor Ironhide the Fist of Gork, he approached the Black Orc war boss as the destruction of Cathay and Nippon were certain. Initially wanting to split Wurzag's shamanistic mask in half with his axe, Grimgor allegedly received a flick on the noggin from Gork himself and decided that Wurzag was too valuable to kill. This value would be swiftly proven as the Greenskin Horde turned west and marched towards the very place that made Grimgor into a Black Orc, the Dark Lands of the Chaos Dwarves. There's in my way, and I want them gone. Gork wants me somewhere else, and I intend to go there. But that ain't here, so go blast them. Yes, oh mighty git, Wurzak squawked, shaking his staff. And stop calling me a git, Grimgor roared. The Green Slaughterer and the Great Green Prophet. Much like when Grimgor first became a Black Orc, his bloody and efficient rise to supremacy inspired the Chaos Dwarf's slaves to stage a massive revolt. With the combined enormity of Grimgor's horde, 
and the number of enslaved greenskins, the Kaelsdorf Empire was overrun once the Horde had liberated the slave pits and mines. Eager to take the fight to their sadistic masters, the Green Tide swallowed the Dark Lands and shattered all remaining Dwarf holds. With Cathay, Nippon and the Chaos Dwarfs trampled beneath his boot, Grimgor ascends his throne as the greatest conqueror to ever live. Then, just as he settled into the glory of victory, he and all of his warriors were suddenly teleported by Gork to partake in the great battle that would eventually decide the fate of the world. While the Green Tide ravaged the northeast realms of the world, in the dark mires of Sylvania, another was bound to the released winds of magic. Revived by the diabolical plans of vampire lord Manfred von Karstein, the infamous necromancer ripped from the vortex after his rebirth the wind of death itself, hoping to instill within him the power of a god. However, it became clear that Manfred's ritual was flawed. The sacrifice of Aliathra, who was assumed to be the daughter of the phoenix king Finnebar, was actually the daughter of Tyrion. Instead of granting the divine blessing of Assyrian, Nagash received the curse of Cain, which sapped Nagash short of ultimate power. Despite Manfred's failure in securing godhood for Nagash, the great necromancer rewarded Manfred for his loyalty by summoning for him a dread abyssal steed named Ashigorath and the title of Mortark. Freed to terrorize the realm once more, Nagash devised his own plan to conquer the world and become the only true god in existence. Sensing the deceit and treachery still within Manfred's mind, Nagash punished the vampire by resurrecting his sire, who would go on to stall Archon's forces in the north and aid Balthazar Gelt's Golden Bastion. Vlad von Kastein, brought to life again through necromancy, defeated Manfred in single combat, despite being weakened and unarmed. Manfred's thralls and supporters quickly turned their allegiance to the true ruler of the von Kastein bloodline, and Nagash made Vlad a Mortark before he was sent north, promising to revive his beloved wife Isabella von Karstein in turn. Meanwhile, the great necromancer and Manfred travelled south to the ancient sands of Nehekara. In that dread desert, beneath the moon's pale gaze, dead men walk. They haunt the shifting dunes of the breathless, windless night brandish weapons of bronze in mocking challenge and bitter resentment of the life they no longer possess. And sometimes, in ghastly dry voices, like the rustling of sun-baked reeds, they whisper the one word they remember from life, the name of the one who cursed them to their existence, more than death but less than life. They whisper the name Nagash. Extract from Liber Necris, translated by Manfred von Karstein. The lands of Nehekara were actually the birthplace of Nagash. In ancient times, when the desert was bustling with the riches of pyramids and dynasties, Nagash was the firstborn of King Ketep and destined to serve in the mortuary cult, a sect of lich priests whose mission was to turn Nehekara into an immortal kingdom where kings ruled in riches evermore. Supremely talented, but also cursed with the jealousy of his brother Thutep, Nagash and a dozen acolytes of the cult seized the throne and entombed Thutep in their own father's temple. Mad with power, he perfected his necromantic arts and concocted the first Elixir of Life, the Nine Books of Nagash, and constructed a massive black pyramid for himself to rival even the Pyramid of Setra, the very king that saw the foundation of the mortuary cult. In those days, Nagash was eventually overthrown by the weary people of Nehekara, but in his grand return in the end times, Nagash hopes to reclaim his pyramid as his throne of godhood. With Manfred aligning with the vampire pirate fleet, commanded by Luthor Harkon, Nagash's invasion force made landfall in Zandri, where the great Mortis River poured into the ocean. Manfred marched south with his legions of Graveguard, Black Knights and White Knights to lay siege to the city, while Harkon's fleets occupied the port and began hailing cannon fire into it. From the sands and tombs deep beneath the desert, immortal constructs rose to send the undead back to their graves. Tomb scorpions, Ushabti guardians and sepulchral knights erupted from the earth and cleaved through the hordes, their stone armor deflecting the blades of their opponents with ease. For days a battle of attrition raged, with each conflict 
further draining Manfred of his ability to resurrect his fallen warriors. Eventually, and by the sheer luck that his lieutenant was able to place a well-timed blade into the back of King Behedish, Manfred and Luthor's assault finally secured the port city from the Nehekaran defense. The vampire count could only look on as Nagash pulled the invasion all the way to Kemri, where his undead encircled the city. Keeping himself concealed from the front lines, Nagash persuaded the tomb kings guarding Marak, City of Hope, to his will. Through the Channel Valley they marched and amassed a gigantic spell to collapse the mountains on both sides of the valley, preventing the armies of Libaris and Resetra from coming to aid Kemri. Now make ready your weapons, my soldiers, for the time is at hand. Go forth, I command you go forth in haste and march with your king into the darkness of the tomb. Make great the name of Setra and Kemri. The darkness draws near, and there are great deeds that remain undone, enemies yet to crush, and raptures yet to rejoice in. So as it is written, so it shall be done. I, Setra, have proclaimed it, and let none dare oppose my will. Inscription on the Great Obelisk of Kemri As Nagash's armies prepared to lay siege to the greatest city of Nehekara, there was one ancient king that would stand defiant before the great necromancer's march to godhood. Revived from his tomb by the Chaos Gods, in exchange for ending the reign of Nagash, Setra the Imperishable awakened from his burial chambers and ordered his city of stone constructs to stand sentinel along the carved walls of his city. Further enraged by the betrayal of the Marak Tomb Kings, tens of thousands of Setra's Hawk Legion answered the call of their king. With regiments of Setra's legendary chariots at the ready, a battle between the two greatest undead empires the world had ever seen was preparing to take place, with the fate of the world at stake. Now make ready your weapons, my soldiers, for the time is at hand. Go forth, I command you go forth in haste and march with your king into the darkness of the tomb. Make great the name of Setra and Kemri. The darkness draws near and there are great deeds that remain undone, enemies yet to crush and raptures yet to rejoice in. So as it is written, so shall it be done. I, Setra, have proclaimed it and let none dare oppose my will. Inscription on the Great Obelisk of Kemri The legions of undead assaulting Kemri were led by an ancient general and one of the original nine dark lords of Nagash, Krell of the Great Axe. Seeing the ancient city's enormity, Krell knew that the size of his army was not conductive to victory, and began to suspect there was more to this attack than his masters had let on. Undismayed, the white raised his black axe towards the walls, undead infantry lurching towards the city to begin the first battle of Kemri. Flooding the northern desert, the masses of undead closed the distance between the first wave and the walls. Just when the walls seemed within reach, the sands shifted and the earth cracked. The legendary stonemason constructs and the statues of the City of Kings came to life and erupted from the walls to trample intruders. From splits in the earth, Forgotten crypts unleashed a swarm of reanimated insect husks and dreaded tomb scorpion constructs to chew and pierce their way effectively through the fray. The lumbering constructs stomped through and over the hordes with little to impede them. Challenging the charge of the titans, volleys from catapults sailed over the dunes to strike the seemingly impenetrable stone armor. The Necrolith Colossus and Hiera Titans resisted volley after volley, striding with deafening footfalls and eventually stomping the artillery to pieces into the sand. Astonished by the decisive loss of artillery, Krell's army reformed and set loose favoured servants of Nagash himself. Morgasts, ossified parodies of the Nehekarin creator god's elite Hammerai, screamed from the sky on tattered leathery wings to swarm the constructs and chip away at the stone behemoths. On the heels of the Kemrian titans arrived the howling Ushabti guardian statues, the red jackals of Rosetra. Clashing blades, the giant halberds of the jackals brought down the attacking Morgasts. The army of Krell quickly dwindled to an elite few, and as the crocodile-headed Ashabti Jade Phalanx closed in on Krell and the last Morgasts, the end for Krell was assured. 
Suddenly, a horn blew across the desert. Then came an ear-splitting boom, and the earth split apart like a great fissure. Arkan the Black, lich king and most loyal of Nagash, had arrived and sundered the earth to force a divide between the army of Khemri and Arkan. Taking advantage of the lull in the fighting, Arkan resurrected the fallen Krell from the stinger of a tomb scorpion and organized his hordes. From the eastern flank, traitor kings Nawanef and Omanhan agreed to hold the eastern flank as the stone constructs began to make their way around the chasm. Seeing fully the traitorous acts of the Marak on the battlefield, Setra exploded in rage. Nine bridgeheads were formed over the chasm at great cost, and over the gap leapt the Ashabti jackal legions, sable spears, and desert vultures. Invigorated by the fury of their king, the legions of Khemri flooded in behind the initial charge. From the great gate of Khemri, blaring horns and war drums announced the arrival of Setra's hawk legions, tens of thousands strong. Setra, carried by the chariot of the gods, made haste directly for Arkan the Black. Hours turned into days, and still the two armies collided over and over again, raising their broken soldiers back to unlife with necromantic magic. As Setra's army closed in on Arkan, the great Hierophant, Katep of Khemri, besieged Setra to reconsider his hasty destruction of the Lich. He advised Setra to focus instead on seeking out the Destroyer of Eternities, the only weapon that could forever kill Nagash. Katep was swiftly removed from Setra's presence for daring to prevent his retribution. Arkan evaded Setra three times during the First Battle of Khemri, but when Setra's greatest champion and only friend, Herald Nakaf, was killed, the king flew into a rage so powerful he tore his way through the undead guard and cleaved Arkan the Black in two. With the Lich King dead, his hordes started to crumble. Setra chained Arkan's body to his chariot and dragged his corpse to Khemri. The battle was won, and the skies above the desert were clearing. Arkan's remains were brought to the Temple of Assyrian, god of the underworld. Setra demanded to see his spirit forever damned to the underworld and ordered his priests to begin the ritual. In his impatience, Setra left the temple partially through the ritual and entrusted the ritual's completion to those present. When Setra's back was turned, High Priest Ankhmer, master of embalming and keeper of the sacred oils, betrayed the king. Weaving a quick spell, he trapped the souls of the other priests, his loyal friends, and used them to resurrect the slain Arkan. Cackling at Setra's mistake, Arkan rose with weary spirit and poured a dark smog from his mouth. Nagash emerged from the mist, having been hosted in Arkan's mortal form, and set course for the Black Pyramid. Setra had departed to the tomb of King Kehikesh to seek out the Destroyer of Eternities. Scouring the crypt, it was discovered that the blade was missing from the tomb, only a silhouette in the dust suggesting its existence. The false hope stoked the king's rage and sent him into another rampage at the invading undead led by Luther Harkon and Manfred von Kastein. The two vampires distracted Setra from Nagash as he closed in on the pyramid. Prowling the base of the pyramid was the Golden Guardian of Petra, a titanic war sphinx carved of black marble and gold. The Guardian lunged at the intruding Nagash but the necromancer bombarded the construct with dark magic until a crack in the construct's armor granted Nagash an opening. Thrusting his staff into the stone underbelly, the Lord of Undeath channeled magic and destroyed the War Sphinx from the inside. With the way to his Black Pyramid clear, Nagash and the Mortarch Dieter Helsnicht approached the main archway and disappeared from the plane. Nagash appeared as a colossus, a mountain over a sea of souls in another plane of existence. The underworld, dark and cheerless, hosted souls in limbo until they were judged to be worthy of paradise or eternal damnation, and there were indeed many souls for Nagash to bind to his will. However, there was yet another enormous being that patrolled there. Assyrian, the, the faceless god of the underworld, met Nagash in combat, for there could be only one god of death. 
the supreme necromancer and the god of death battled like roaring gods, eldritch magic crackling like lightning as the two competed for the Sea of Souls. As the battle raged, Dieter successfully completed a ritual to bind all of the souls to him. Flicking his wrist, the Mortark blasted Assyrian with the entirety of the souls in the sea below. Nagash delivered three resounding and final blows that shook the entire underworld, then dove onto the corpse and consumed what remained of Assyrian. Having claimed the power of death, the Necromancer rose as the new god of death. A ripple of energy pulsed from the Black Pyramid in all directions. A windstorm swept across Nehekara, swallowing the desert in icy darkness. Khemri's bronze gates were cast in darkness, and from a dizzying pillar of swirling magic, Nagash emerged from the realm of the dead to enter Khemri again. The struggle between undead armies paused to look on in shock at the arrival of the new god of death. What could be done against the will of a god? Ever indomitable and prideful, Setra shouted a rallying cry and charged his armies toward Nagash, beginning the Second Battle of Khemri. Mirroring their general's defiance, the Nehekaran warriors blitzed against Nagash's renewed wave of undead. From the underworld, insects burst onto the battlefield to surge and overcrowd the oncoming armies. Emerging from the fray with heavy quaking steps, a mighty bronze colossus tramped through the front line and raised its massive greatsword towards Nagash. With but a single stare, Nagash silenced the Colossus and ensnared command of it. The bronze being turned down upon his former allies to annihilate them, entirely captured by the Death God. Even the Lich Priests were unable to free the Construct from the powerful magic, and when a call to the Underworld was made to resurrect Nehekaran warriors, it was not Assyrian who answered, but Nagash. Dismayed by this realization, the tide of battle shifted in Nagash's favor. He seemed impervious to harm, and summoned a storm of flaming skulls onto the ranks of the sable spears around him. As the sands charred, a sudden spear strike found its mark on Nagash. Rising from the sands beneath Nagash, the cursed Scarab Lord of Namas joins the battle. Prince Apophas has long waited to claim a soul that would replace his own in the underworld, and wielded the very destroyer of eternities that Setra had discovered missing. Feeling the sting of pain not felt for thousands of years, but still unhindered in his godly state, Nagash unceremoniously cast Apophas's body to the ground with a mocking laugh. Setra's chariots carved a path to Nagash as his undead crumpled around him, and when the stampeding wall of chariots was less than 200 yards away, the great necromancer's eye sockets exploded with withering beams, sailing towards the chariots and disintegrating most of Setra's charioteer horde. All that remained from the devastating attack were three charioteers of the royal guard, Setra himself, and a dozen of the winged legion. With fifty yards between the necromancer and the king, Nagash chanted a spell and thrust his arms skyward. Across the desert, Ethereal hands and skeletal arms ripped through the earth and clung on to the wheels and hooves of the chariots. The lighter chariots were dragged into the sands, but Setra and his royal guard were far too heavy and armoured to be slowed. Finally within reach, Setra swung the blade of Petra, pierced the gloomy miasma around the necromancer and threw him to the ground. The chariot of the gods wheeled around for another strike, but before Setra could close the distance, Nagash pointed his staff at the king and bellowed out a harrowing scream. With it, the brooch of Assyrian that afforded the King of Kings a ward against all magical harm was rendered useless, and Setra was immolated with life-leeching miasma. Still clinging to life and as iron-willed as ever, Setra challenged Nagash to an honorable duel. Though a powerful being, Nagash was always a coward by heart, and refused to accept the king's challenge. Extending his ossified hand to Setra, he halted the king's charge like an insect frozen in amber. Lifting him high into the air and beneath the looming shadow of Nagash, one offer was given to the tomb king. I have humbled you, Setra, proudest of kings, but now I offer you honor. Bow before me and you will become one of my Mortaks. 
deny me and perish. Raising his gaze in silence to meet the empty sockets of the necromancer, Setra's reply echoed throughout the last days of the dying world. Setra does not serve. Setra rules. Nagash's outstretched claw flashed in a sickening green light. Setra's body broke in nauseating snaps, and his appendages were flung carelessly across the sands. The imperishable had finally met his defeat, securing the way for Nagash to finally claim his prized Black Pyramid. Setra's skull, partially buried in the sand and still clinging to unlife, watched in impotence whilst Khemri's last stone titans broke themselves trying to exact revenge for their fallen king. The city of kings, which had stood since time itself, was destroyed, sunken into the sands from collapsed crypts and crumbling ancient pathways below, save for the dreaded Black Pyramid. It tore a crater into the desert as it took flight, seeming weightless beneath the beams of jade light that carried it and the shambling hordes beneath back to Sylvania. And so Setra remained, skull buried in the sand, and tormented with the endless and humiliating view of his broken kingdom. The skies remained black, and the wind was like ice, a cruel mockery of the once blistering heat of desert weather. Wordlessly, the king raged, only raising his voice to angrily shout away the carrion that fought over the bones like tokens to be plucked. But each day they grew bolder and unafraid, and Setra knew that they would eventually scatter his bones all across Nehekara. The broken king wished he were mortal, if so only that he could die. Just as the wind howled again, his body began to regenerate. Vigor and strength surged through his scattered bones, the limbs returning to him by some trick of magic. Standing to his feet, the king heard the whispering of four voices upon the dark wind that blew. They proclaimed in laughter, the battle is over only if you wish it. You can be a king again. But Setra gave no reply and stared towards the desert until the world met its end. You and your masters are desiccated relics of a dead age. And what greater prospect do I have in Nagash's service? A future of mindless servitude in an unchanging world. The great necromancer is a selfish child. Though assured of his power, he remains forever terrified that another will take it from him. He will not be satisfied until his is the only will in existence, for only then can he be safe. Heinrich Kemmler, talking to his nemesis, Arkan the Black. The Black Pyramid sailed north over desert, sea and mountains, until it bore itself a new resting place in the tainted land of Sylvania. With time, the pyramid siphoned and stored the powerful death magic of the county, nearing the moment when Nagash might have been able to challenge even the invading chaos gods themselves. He overlooked a critical weakness, however. Distracted by the huge invasion of Nurgle demons ransacking the Empire, Nagash turned a blind eye to the tunneling skaven beneath his prized pyramid. A team led by the infamously intelligent warlock engineer Ikit Claw bore through the stone with warp grinders and planted six warp bombs, twice as many as needed to bring the pyramid down into the heart of the structure. Escaping during the heat of conflict, the bombs were detonated. Four great thunderous tolls were heard, like the heartbeats of a dying titan. Green fire incinerated the interior, and the pyramid finally collapsed. Hunks of masonry flew over Sylvania from the initial blast, and crashed down onto the lakes, ruins, and crypts of the tainted county. The allies of Chaos, the Skaven, had annihilated any chance of Nagash obtaining the power to challenge them. With each diabolical plan completed, the clans grew more and more coordinated on a scale not seen since the beginning of the Under Empire. And yet there were still other schemes to complete, with the next phase of their master plan targeting the Dwarven kingdoms of Karazankor. We sons of Grungi may have drunk deep from the bitter waters of misfortune, but we yet survive. Whilst a single dwarf draws breath, we will fight the evils that assail us, and we will never ever give up. Hengist Stonebelly, Dwarf Longbeard. Also known as the Elder Race or the Dawi, 
The dwarves were amongst the oldest, proudest and richest of the known mortal races. Renowned for their stubborn nature, the end times military tactics of the Dwarf Empire, or the Karazhan Corps as they call it in their tongue of Khazalid, relied on the unmatched artillery and expert defensive stonemasonry of their holds. Unlike men and elves, dwarves were unable to channel, let alone perceive, the winds of magic, and instead developed the closely guarded art of runesmithing. Without igniting the dangerous power within the winds, the runesmiths would trap the potent magic and hold it safely in their craft. As the inevitable march of doom closed in around their mountain homes, long hoarded vaults of these valuable weapons would be opened in hopes of withstanding the coming storm. The expansion of the Skaven Warfront accelerated with horrifying efficiency after the supremely successful offensive in Astalia and Talea. The coordination between clans reached the most coherent in Under-Empire history during the end times, seen when the lesser clans hidden deep in the mountain ranges confederated and surprised Zufbar with a siege under the leadership of Clan Ferric. Simultaneously, Ikit Claw led an assault on Karak Kedrin with the underground aid of Clan Creepus and Clan Mulder. At the coast of Barak Var, the harbour strongholds encountered invading Skaven clan fleets and in the south, Clan Moors marched for Carrick Eight Peaks. Assaulted from so many fronts, the dwarves fell for the initial scheme of the Lord of Decay to isolate the dwarves from one another and whittle them down through attrition. We will bring down their decaying empire, and the children of the horned rats shall inherit the ruins. I will see that it is Clan Moors that emerges preeminent from this extermination. Finish them quickly. Go to help the others complete the tasks they will not be able to finish on their own. Clan Moors must look strong. Clan Moors must be victorious. Lord Nordwell, warlord of Clan Moors. And so Nordwell ordered his protege. When it became clear that the Dwarf Empire was feeling the pressure of multiple sieges, Lord Nordwell decreed that the prize of Karaza Karak, the ancient Dwarf Hold of Eight Peaks, would go to none but Clan Moors alone. The mountain hold had been in constant struggle for control between dwarfs, greenskins and skaven for some time, and so Nordell ordered his protege, Queek Headtaker, to lead the hordes of rats into the mountain and claim it for moors. The bulk of the southern skaven armies gnawed their way into the mountain in numbers uncountable and sprung an ambush upon the greenskins holding a strategic point in the peaks. Tunneling across the mountain, the suffocating masses of slaves pushed down the occupying greenskins through the crossroads and out of the mountain into Groby Town. Queek very nearly killed Skarsnik during the retreat, but stopped his pursuit once outside the Ancestor Vault to regroup his infantry. Deep beneath the two armies in the trench, a massive reinforcement of 100,000 Skaven from 38 different warlord clans and several thousand Clan Mulder warbeasts tunneled up towards the surface. For a moment, Queek considered sabotaging his own reinforcements, but did not commit to invoking the wrath of Nordwell. Instead, Queek organized the placement of several warp bombs along the major peaks of the city, and in their detonation, annihilated Karana and severely damaged the rest. The Greenskins were forced to retreat further into the mountain and into the mines. From the trenches, 70,000 clan rats gnawed upwards into the Grand Avenue and poured into the Hall of Reckoning, surprising the garrison of defending dwarfs. Remaining stalwart in their duty, the throng of Dawi repelled the Skaven and maintained control over the Hall. Meanwhile, in treating the routed greenskins with a tempting offer, Vermin Lord Suthnora promised Sarsnik a portion of Karak Eight Peaks when the battle had been won in exchange for attacking the halls of Clan Skalfdom. Even if Skarsnik knew the folly of trusting a rat, the Greenskins agreed to the temporary alliance and lay in wait beneath the King's Hall until the right moment. Above ground, Queek Headtaker broke the lull of battle with a ferocious charge, advancing against the Great Gate of Defiance with his infamous Red Guard. Poisoned globes from a team of Vatbanks sailed over the Red Guard and landed inside the gatehouses and battlements, creating a poisonous miasma that gave the mutant beasts time to dismantle the gate. Once the huge door had been opened, an imposing wall of armoured stone plate dwarfs stubbornly prevented any further advancement into the King's Hall. There, surrounded by his legendary Iron Brotherhood, 
the king of Karak Eight Peaks, Belagar Ironhammer, awaited another fateful meeting with the Skaven that had long tried and failed to claim his head. In the heat of the assault on the gates, a horn sounded from the peak of Karak Lun. Down the mountain, barreling towards the front lines of the Skaven, lumbering packs of ogre mercenaries and Mornfang cavalry answered the call. Taken totally by surprise, the Skaven morale shattered, and the rat packs fell back to Grubby Town their retreat covered by dead-eye snipers pelting into the fat bodies of the ogres. When it seemed that the dwarves were gaining a foothold, another surprise attack yet again turned the tides of battle. From the mines, Sarsnake's greenskins sprung the promised attack on the unsuspecting hall of Clan Skelfton. Besieged from both over and under their mountain, word quickly spread of Skarsnake's successful capture of the clan hall. Upon receiving the news, the ogre mercenaries betrayed the dwarves and began a renewed assault on the Great Gate of Defiance. The absolute chaos of the quickly changing tide of battle led to a slaughter of dwarves, ogre, orc and skaven alike. The Grey Seer Krenskrit, leading the expertly timed final wave of skaven reinforcements up from the trenches and caves, called upon his magic. The rocks and tunnels collapsed in the mines and Skelfton Clan Hall, trapping Skarsnik's greenskins inside. Queek's front line committed to another charge at the gates in the chaos, forcing the ogres to retreat and the dwarves to fall back into the king's hall. The warrior king Belagar met Queek in single combat, refusing to capitulate to the Skaven invaders. Pathetic, flea-ridden vermin, swift and twitchy, there's not a dwarf alive who isn't worth twenty of you. Queek has killed many hundred beard things, Queek will kill one more very soon. Probably. I am tired and I am beaten, and the memory of our last encounter festers still in my flesh. But even as you hack the head from my neck, Queek, you will know that you could never best me in more honourable circumstances. Belagar Ironhammer faces Queek Headtaker. Surrounded by the spear points of Queek's Red Guard, the King and the Warlord dueled for what seemed like hours. Only when the King's body could stand no longer, did Queek land the Dwarf Gouger's spike through Belagar's helmet, Queek himself simultaneously sustaining a near-fatal wound under his armpit. Bloodied and battered, Queek claimed Belagar's head for a trophy. No Dwarf nor Greenskin survived as rats poured into the tunnels, and then Eight Peaks came under total control of the Under Empire. In just as devastating a loss as in Karak Eight Peaks, Slayer Keep in the North was lost to the genius of Ikit Claw after the entire hold was suffocated with clouds of toxic gas. At the last possible moment, a wind of magic sailed in through the mountain gates and found the last of the remaining dwarves awaiting their agonizing death defending Karak Kadrin. A wind of Akshi, the lore of fire, bound itself to the Slayer King Ungrim Ironfist. A maelstrom of purging fire veiled itself around the last of the Karak Kadrin garrison and banished any trace of the toxic miasma. Left behind were uncountable Dorvan casualties, and with a heavy and angered heart, Ungrim made his way south to the Dorvan capital of Karazakarak. Refugees poured into Karazakarak with grave news of the cracked moon, the endless tides of rats, a broken empire, and the return of Nagash. High King Thorgrim Grudgebearer, unable to ignore the signs of the times, ordered the greatest vaults of weapons to be opened, and prepared his throngs for war. For the entirety of my reign I have desired to march out with the axe hosts of the Dawi kingdoms and exterminate the Skaven. Time and again I argued that this alone would save our kind. But you counselled against it, you and your like, Nokim. And so we find ourselves skulking like trapped badgers in our hole, while our enemy, allowed to grow unchecked to uncountable numbers, plots our final demise. No more! High King Thorgrim Grudgebearer. Ikit descended from the north, while Queek with Greylord Kansrit from the south closed in on the Silver Road. At this point, the Skaven numbered in the millions and converged onto the Granite Gate. Assaults on the defences were daily, seldom giving the dwarves time to breathe and organise a counter to the innumerable rats. An enormous belching of warp fire melted down Granite Gate just as the king emerged with Ironbreaker infantry and Iron Drake flamethrowers, 
but 50 cannons managed to fire their payload in the last moment and obliterate the streaming tide of Skaven slaves aiming to contest the king's arrival. Out of the smoke billowing off the squashed legion of Skaven slaves, a mighty vermin lord stepped out of a portal and onto the silver road before the granite gate. The High King challenged the vermin lord to a duel, who landed a shocking blow through the king's runic armor of Skaldor. None before had ever cracked it. When it seemed that the war had been so easily won, Thorgrim's armor shone like silver as another wind of magic found its target. Chamon, the lore of metal, bound to the High King and reinvigorated the warrior. He exploded in righteous rage and hacked the vermin lord with the axe of Grimnir, turning to shout his demands of vengeance to the shocked onlooking Skaven army. For the deaths of Hengo Balderson and the loss of 97 ore carts of Grumril, 500 Thagaraki heads. For the loss of the lower deeps of Karakvan, 2,000 Thagaraki hides. For the cruel slaying of the last kinsfolk of Karak Asgal, 900 tails and hides. For the slaughter of the miners of Karak Akra, 50 Thagaraki hides. For the deaths of Rune Lord Krag and his seven apprentices, and the loss of the Rune of Persistence, 900 tails. For the warpstone poisoning of the Drak River, the life of Ikit Claw, for Karazak Karak, for the Karazan Kor. High King Thorgrim Grudgebearer, last king of Karazan Kor. Lines of smoke burst from the king's missile infantry onto the onlooking Skaven. The skies above the Silver Road turned dark from massive magical pollution coming from the north. Organ guns were wheeled to the melted gates and began peppering the Skaven back lines with devastating barrages. Warp lightning cannons traded fire with the dwarves, streaking green crackling blasts across the valley. A rush of doom flayers weaved an advance towards the king's front line, but they and the clan rats in their wake were blown to smithereens by cannons expertly hidden in the surrounding rocks and bluffs of the gate. Hoping to secure a path for their allies above ground, a surprise pack of clan rats emerged from freshly gnawed tunnels under the gate. For a moment, the guns and cannons silenced their thunderous bombardment, and it seemed as if the dwarves had retreated into the mountain. The Skaven war machines approached the wounded gate unchallenged, and just as they had begun to fire, the door to the kingdom flung open. Thousands of howling beards charged out of the gate, following the throne of power and reclaiming control of the disrupted war machines. Falling for the false retreat, the first Skaven wave suffered a decisive defeat, and the lightning cannons were obliterated. Armed with rune-infused weapons, the dwarves established an uncontestable killing zone, burning a bloody path through the Skaven by the thousands. The dwarven charge proved so effective that they managed to carve a way into the Rictus and Moor's encampments nearby and destroy the reserve artillery. Ikit Claw and a regiment of storm vermin and warp fire throwers emerged from hidden tunnels and doused the king's front line. Amazingly, the dwarves marched through the warp fire unharmed and collided in melee with the ratmen. Again, the Skaven routed, and the momentum of victory seemed to sway to the side of the dwarves. But as a brigade of doom wheels rolled up and over the hills, Thorgrim realized he had made a critical error. His forces had strayed too far from the mountain and were about to pay the price. Speeding down the slope and crackling with unstable warp lightning, the doom wheels punched through the armor of the dwarfs and careened wildly across the lines of infantry. Packs of Skaven slaves rushed into the gaps and began isolating the dwarven companies. Once Thorgrim and his Everguard were cut off from the bulk of his forces, Queek rushed out from the Skaven mobs with powerful rat ogres and the Red Guard crashing into the throng protecting Thorgrim. Overwhelmed by the concentration of force, the Everguard began to lose ground. The king prepared to retreat, but at the final moment, a hailing of arrows pelted the flank of the Red Guard. From the foothills, Ungrim Ironfist sallied out with Bugman's rangers to smite Queek's brazen attack. Panicked by the effective flank, the Skaven Night Runners dove into the brush around the rangers to try and stall their advance, but were slaughtered by the superior warriors. The moment had been granted for Thorgrim to enact vengeance, and so he shouted aloud the payment he demanded from the Skaven. For the battle of Karakazul, the head of Queek. For the killing of Belagar Angrund, rightful king of Karak Eight Peaks, the head of Queek. For the death of many thousand Dawi, the head of Queek. Now die, you miserable sons of the sewers! 
High King Thorgrim Grudgebearer, last king of Karazankor. The throne of power was carried into single combat with Queek. The rat placed his faith in his armor-piercing dwarf gouger, but Thorgrim parried and cleaved the infamous Dowie killing weapon in two with his runic axe. The king's gauntlet swatted Queek's side sword away and thrust his hand in a crushing hold over the rat's throat. Holding him high in his crushing grasp for his warriors to see, Thorgrim shook the Skaven's body, snapped his neck, and cast him aside into the many thousands of dead rats around. Queek had been defeated, and a massive rout rippled through the Skaven ranks as the dwarves secured the Silver Road. Gyro bombers circled around the Silver Road and bombarded the Skaven as they evacuated the valley. Thorgrim looked around the valley, the heavy cost to his kingdom weighing on his heart. Heavier and heavier he felt, until he realized that the invigorating power had left him entirely. His armor lost its gleam, and the Rune of Azamar, an artifact said to have been crafted by the ancestor god himself, sustained a crack. It was said that as long as the Rune endured, so would the dwarf race. The king kept this damning secret to himself as he sulked back to the mountain. Telling none of the loss of the rune, he climbed the thousands of concealed steps to the highest mountain, and remembered the names and clans of each dwarf that had perished to save the kingdom. At the roof of the world, he finally attained some sense of ease, overlooking the long horizon of the kingdom. Unbeknownst to Thorgrim, a shadow had followed him all the way to the peak. When his back was turned, the shadow leapt from concealment and plunged thrice-blessed warp blades through the great armor of Skaldor. Deathmaster Snitch, chief assassin of Clan Eshin, had snuck in and ended the reign of the High King. As the life left Thorgrim's eyes, a portal between worlds tore open and ushered even more hundreds of damnable rats onto the mountain. On that day, Karazakarek finally fell to the rats. The Three-Eyed King has long awaited this moment, the hour of which his destiny is at last unveiled. He leads an army of madness and rage, against which no sane being would willingly stand. Perhaps I am not sane, as I will fight one last time, not for victory, but for survival, for the hope that a spark can endure. It is a slender hope, and the laughter of the Dark Gods rings loud in my ears. These are the end times. Prophecy of the End Times Before Archon could truly bring forth the end of the world, the fortress city of Middenheim had to be taken. This was a daunting task even for the Ever Chosen, as the fortress was built on and around an unyielding mountain that stood tall over Drakvald, one of the five largest forests in Imperial territory, and had never fallen to any invader. But the need to seize the city directly from the forces of order was absolutely necessary, for beneath Middenheim rested an artifact left behind by the Old Ones themselves. With it, a ritual could be performed to tear open a portal directly to the Chaos Realm and doom the world forever. Wasting no time, Archon marshaled his countless legions under the banners of Korn and Sinch, the enormous march attracting the attention of fearful red eyes in the shadows. News of Archon's next move quickly reached the Council of Thirteen in far-off Skavenblight, sparking a vicious debate between the Lords of Decay. While supremely successful in nearly all of their invasions, the Under Empire was feeling the sting of losses. They chittered and screamed, should the Under Empire attack the Ever Chosen? Should they run Skitter away and heal? The Council was paralyzed by panicked indecision and infighting, and just as they were ready to leap over the table and frantically tear each other apart, the greatest of the Vermin Lords, Screech Vermin King, appeared before the arguing council. He reminded the Lords that their pledge to the Great Horned Rat was always to devour the people of the civilized world totally, and that it could still be achieved. Screech advised that if the Under Empire were successful, they would force the Scions of Chaos to accept the Skaven as equals, and perhaps even their masters. The Council, unable to resist the temptation of ruling over not only the world but the Apocalypse itself, agreed to send an envoy to the Three-Eyed King. Screech Vermin King summoned a Rat Ogre bodyguard for Thankwall to accompany him on their trek north. Afraid of offending Archon with any military presence, they did not bring any military regiment to protect them. 
The three emerged to the surface near the greatly accelerated march of Archon's vanguard and made the uneasy walk towards the heart of the army. Demons and warriors surrounded them as they dared to approach the Ever Chosen, and many times Than Kuol thought to abandon the envoy and hide away. But eventually, the three rats found the encampment of Archon and his elite and bent the knee to the Ever Chosen. Astride Dorgar, Archon considered the offer brought from the council. The Under Empire would serve chaos in the final days. Beside Archon perched Kairos Fateweaver, acting as Archon's eyes into both the past and future. Like all Skaven, Thanquol spoke much but said very little. All the while, Kairos interrupted to ask a bizarre range of questions to discern unknowable details. After deliberation, Archon accepted the Under Empire's pledge and Thanquol gleefully returned to the Council. With this news, he assured himself, he was destined to claim an unoccupied seat on the Council. He prostrated himself as the saviour of the entire Skaven race and set to work plotting terrible schemes. Oblivious to the deal struck between Chaos and the Under Empire, Emperor Karl Franz struggled to maintain morale. Talapheim, the great crater fortress of the Empire, had been lost. Altdorf was suffering the final days before its fall, and nearly every village and hamlet was being ransacked by beastmen, demons and plague. During the final hours of the Glotkin siege on Altdorf, Valten, chosen of Sigmar, and Magister Patriarch of the Amber Order, Gregor Martaf, arrived from the east after the failed effort to maintain Gelt's Golden Bastion. They witnessed the freed wind of magic bound to the Emperor as the incarnation of Sigmar himself, and kneeled in total devotion, awaiting orders. A massive Skaven army emerged from the earth and encircled dying Altdorf, forcing Karl Franz into an impossible decision. He entrusted Valten to play the role of distraction in the north, while he dedicated his resources to securing a swift exit south and towards one of the few remaining Imperial strongholds in Averheim. The Emperor demanded that Valten and Martaf make an effort to survive and rendezvous in a town north of Kemperbad moments before the diversion was launched. Though encircling an easy target, the living sea of ratmen squabbled and fought amongst themselves. Capitalizing on the Skaven's disorganization, Valten and Martak rode out of the northern gatehouse and launched a surprise skirmish. Hysteria broke out among the Skaven ranks, providing the perfect opportunity for the Emperor, the last of the Bretonian knights, the Reichsguard, and the Knights Griffin to escape with as many civilians as they could manage through the south gate and towards Kemperbad. The diversion was successful, but Valten quickly realized that he and his men were stranded deep in hostile territory with neither food nor shelter, and the wilds crawled with raiding beastmen. However, Martak, as a powerful amber wizard, knew the wilds well and summoned one of his many woodland familiars. A black raven whispered news that the nearby fortress city of Middenheim still stood defiant whilst besieged by Skaven. Inspired by the legendary resilience of the city, they changed course to the City of the White Wolf, gathering surviving garrisons and militia along their way. Swelling to numbers of a proper army, Voltan and Martak again surprised the Skaven surrounding Middenheim and animated the Elector Count's men into a coordinated defense. Voltan's arrival also served as a surprise charge into the Skaven rearguard. The rats scattered and cleared a path into the underbelly of the Skaven army. But as Voltan managed to carve a path halfway through the pack of rats, the Skaven rattling guns and poisoned wind mortars turned their attention onto the Imperials and opened fire, caring not if they annihilated their own regiments in the process. The bombardment caused Voltan mass casualties. It seemed that this was where he and his men were going to die, until a horn sounded from the southern gatehouse of Middenheim. The drawbridge slammed open as Elector Count Boris Todbringer and the Knights of the White Wolf made a ferocious charge into the Skaven front lines. Boris was successful in carving the rest of the way towards the safety of the city. Once he and Volten rendezvoused, they turned around and forced their way back into the city. Again it seemed that Volten and Martak had found themselves stuck in a city under siege, but they found that Middenheim was in much less dire straits. 
Inside the city, the unexpected reinforcements found food and rest, while Voltan and Martak joined Todbringer in the great Temple of Ulrich for an urgent war council. The Elector Count declared that the arrival of Voltan was fortuitous, and provided a justified opportunity to deploy a sudden strike against his old adversary, Beast Lord Kazrak the One-Eye. Without allowing a chance for discourse, the Elector Count designated Voltan as acting Lord of Middenheim in his absence, and organized his troops for another charge out of the gate. Again, Todbringer and the Wolf Knights barreled through the weakened Skaven front line, weaving through the siege camps with ferocious speed as they made for the last portions of the Drakvold that had not yet been cut down to fuel the Under Empire's war machines. Diving headlong into the bowels of the darkened forest, they encountered an alarming number of beastmen, much more than they anticipated. Where they thought an easy ambush had presented itself, they instead realized that they had marched to their deaths. Packs of Ungor and Minotaur scrambled into skirmishing maneuvers and slaughtered both the knights and infantry. Knowing there were few options, Todbringer unsheathed his rune fang and pushed even further into the beastmen herd alone. Indeed, he found the one-eyed beast lord who eagerly uncoiled his scourge whip to face Todbringer in single combat again. The beast men brayed and snorted as they duelled, stirring into an enraged frenzy as Boris attained an advantage and stabbed the rune fang deep into Kazrak's remaining good eye. The herd dogpiled onto Boris and ripped him to shreds, decorating the forest with his viscera as the drums of the apocalypse drew nearer. The three-eyed king has come. With the empire in flames, Archon Ever Chosen has marched south with all the armies of ruin at his heels to claim his birthright and usher in the Age of Chaos. The city of Middenheim, one of the few bastions remaining to men, dwarves and elves, is his target, for buried deep within the mighty rock upon which it sits is an ancient weapon with which he will bring about his ultimate victory. Prophecy of the End Times the very same day that the Elector Count marched himself to his terrible fate, Archon's enormous army arrived at Middenheim from the northeast. Like vermin fleeing the rising flood of a sinking ship, the Skaven siege dissolved before the presence of the Ever Chosen. Black clouds and crackling lightning blotted the sky above the advancing frontrunners of the Chaos Army. Chariots, hulking Chaos Knights, Chaos Hounds, and even Dragon Ogres were peppered along the regiments of Northmen and Chaos Warriors. Volten scrambled to fortify the Great Temple of Ulrich, the words of Boris himself fresh on his mind. As long as the fire of the Great Temple lasts, Middenheim and Middenland will never fall. Boris Todbringer, Elector Count and Grand Duke of Middenland and Middenheim. Archon awaited to give the attack order, confronting his supposed Skaven allies over their miserable attempt to siege the city and weaken it prior to his arrival. Cowering before the Three-Eyed King, they pledged a renewed assault by his command. The Skaven Warlord and the Ever Chosen devised a cunning plan. The viaduct gatehouses were a critical capture point if they had any hope of breaching Middenheim's defences, and Skaven were infamous for the art of infiltration. Volten, wise to the tactics of the Ratmen, assigned Martak to oversee the defense of the Middenheim tunnels, while he commanded the men on the walls and in the streets. Kairos whispered a harrowing detail about the unfolding truth of Middenheim's fall, for there was a thief right under the nose of Volten that would destroy the very hope they clung to. Appearing as a thief in the night, Teklis infiltrated the city and snuck into the temple. He stole the very flame that brought the defending men hope, planning to use it to revive his brother, Tyrion, who was killed during the disastrous collapse of the Vortex. As quickly as Teclis came, he vanished, and the city left behind was thrown into a cacophony of panic. Wasting no time, Archon gave the order to begin the assault while Middenheim was in disarray. In the tunnels of the mountain, the very first wave of invaders crawled and gnawed up into the defending companies of seasoned infantry. Pack after pack of Skaven slaves and clan rats died, but gave the real Skaven fighting force a perfect opportunity to enact their carefully planned scheme. Clan Eshin gutter runners invaded the gatehouses unseen and planted concealed devices at the base of each building. 
Retreating a safe distance back, the devices were triggered. Of course, the Skaven weapons were as faulty as they were cruel, and both the southern and western devices malfunctioned. The devices in the north and east gatehouse worked perfectly, however, and spewed a noxious gas that rose and filled the towers completely, damning the defending garrisons to a horrid death as they drowned in the pus that filled their lungs. The gutter runners doubled back, fixed with gas masks to infiltrate the gatehouses again. They cut the throats of any stragglers and opened the drawbridges. The horns of Archon's army sounded and they poured into the gatehouses like a black tide. Above, Kairos's flight of flamer demons took to the sky, awaiting the perfect moment to douse the city in demonic flame. Volten's defenders and Archon's front line crashed together in a bloody fight for control over the north and east portions of the city. Volten managed to hold off the first wave until the arrival of the Dark Omen Malagor. The winged beastmen, feared and hated by men, soared into battle from Archon's army and weaved a spell over Volten's defenders. The men fell to the ground, their bodies contorting hideously until they were unrecognizable beasts. This forced Volten to fall back, the streets quickly being overrun with demons, beastmen and chaos warriors. Volten accompanied the Knights of the White Wolf in their gallops around the inside of the city that the Imperials still controlled, invigorating the defenders with courage and resilience. For a few hours, the Knights and Volten were able to ensure a second chance at fending off the invaders that had breached the gatehouses. That hope quickly faded as Martak and the forces originally intended to guard the mountain tunnels emerged from their underground posts overrun by the unlimited numbers of Skaven bodies flooding the mountain. The Skaven army beneath the city gave chase to Martak and his survivors. Right before a devastating flank from the Skaven collided with Volten's men, Martak's eyes shone with icy white light as the wolf god Ulrich hosted himself in the powerful Amber Wizard. With the rage of winter itself, a massive blizzard was conjured around Martak that killed hundreds of Skaven in the blink of an eye. Seeing a break in the horde, Volten and Martak rushed through the opening to retreat to the Temple of Ulrich for their last stand, placing faith in the strength of Sigmar and Ulrich to destroy Archon in this siege. The mortars and the Hellstorm rocket batteries rained death down into the streets as they were emptied and replaced with uncountable Chaos Warriors. Countering the offense, Malagor took flight and summoned a murder of crows to peck out the eyes of the artillery teams. Extending a beastly claw towards the Knights of the White Wolf, he summoned a portal beneath them and the road devoured the regiment entirely. However, in this overextension, Martak managed to catch the Dark Omen distracted and impaled him with a magic amber spear. The Dark Omen was dead and a cheer of rejuvenated morale erupted from the city. Ominously, the streets continued to empty, the Chaos Warriors parting way for the terrifying Swords of Chaos, the personal servants of the Everchosen himself. Through Martak, the Wolf God's magic summoned another Ice Storm Blast towards Archon and his elite, but they emerged unscathed. The last remaining Wolf Knights and ferocious and barbaric Fell Wolf Brotherhood contested the march of the Swords of Chaos and held them off for a time. Kairos foresaw certain victory and flew his horrors over the mountain to the western portion of Middenheim. At the same time, Martak sensed a disturbance in the winds of magic and broke from the northeastern streets to pursue the flying demons of Sinch, dedicating the wolf god's winter magic to douse out any arcane flames that Kairos could summon. As the defense of Middenheim began to fall apart in the Pandemonium, the Temple of Ulrich suffered a tunneling ambush by the bulk of the Skaven army under Warlord Skraslik. Volten was forced to duel the Warlord just as Martak was forced to duel Kairos. Kairos, infuriated by Martak's meddling with the certain future, was bested by the winter magic and was forced to retreat. The Northeast, however, succumbed to a damning setback as Archon isolated the Grand Master of the Wolf Knights, Axel Weisberg. Despite his speed, the Ever Chosen pulled him from his horse and tore his torso in half, painting his onlooking men with viscera. With this kill, Archon effectively gutted the morale of the Northeastern Front and advanced towards the Temple of Ulrich. Vardak fared much better than Axel, quickly gaining the upper hand against the Skaven Warlord and killing him. 
The rats temporarily fled back into the tunnels, but the Ever Chosen continued his ascent to the temple. Charging towards each other in an encounter that will seal the fate of the very world, the Slayer of Kings and Galmaraz crashed together with a thunderous boom. None had hoped to even be able to touch Archon, but in their duel, Voltan and the magical Warhammer landed a decisive blow to the Ever Chosen's armor and dented it heavily. However, the upper hand was soon lost, as Voltan's head was suddenly lopped off his shoulders by a cowardly vermin lord, invoking the wrath of the Ever Chosen. Martak rushed to reinforce Voltan and was dismayed to discover his death. The Amber Wizard committed a massive burst of ice onto the Vermin Lord and Archon, but the Ever Chosen again emerged unharmed from the magic. Closing the gap, Archon swiped his sword across Martak and cleaved him in two, securing victory for Chaos. So soon the hour of fate comes around. The Ever Chosen stirs from his dark throne and prepares the blow that shall split the world asunder. Realms of old have fallen, lost beneath the fury of the Northlands, or smothered by vermin from below. Some heroes battle on, too stubborn to realize all hope is lost. Their time is past, and a new age of chaos and dismay beckons. Perhaps I am foolish also, for I fight with no hope of victory. I seek only to weaken the Dark Gods, to shake their hold upon the future. No other course remains, not to mortals nor the Divine." Lilith, Goddess of Prophecy Middenheim was lost, and the artifact of the Old Ones needed to plunge the world into eternal darkness was firmly in the grasp of Archon. Survivors fled to Averheim with news of the city's fall, but Karl Franz forbade them from speaking more of it to avoid panic amongst their men. Still committed to fighting to the last breath among friends, Ungrim's slayers and the Grail Knights remained at the side of the Imperials even as Archon pushed his invasion and besieged Averheim. Humanity, even with no hope for victory or survival, made a stand against the most feared warlords of Khorne to rival the glory of even Sigmar's conquests. Even after being whittled down by constant hell cannons, the Knights of Humanity and Bretonia charged out into the streets and bled the army of Khorne as much as they could before meeting their own demise. Balthazar Gelt, having absorbed the Wind of Metal since High King Thorgrim's assassination, summoned a legion of Golden Dwarf statues to do battle beside the Slayers and Ungrim, who were surrounded by a maelstrom of fire. The factions of Order fought until they were forced to evacuate the city, leaving the dwarves behind to die the glorious death they sought. As the Emperor and Bretonians fled for Athel Loren to meet with the remaining incarnates, Averheim and the entire Chaos Force sent to take it were obliterated in a hail of fire, the fate of Ungrim unknown. In Athel Loren, the incarnates gathered to weigh their limited choices. However, discourse broke out among them as Nagash approached the Council, hoping to strike a deal between the forces of Order and the Undead in the wake of his failed ascension to Godhood. Before we explore the final events of the End Times, let us recap the major geopolitical events of the story that have led us to this point. In 2519 IC, the twin-tailed comet streaked across the sky, and within the Chaos Realms, the four Dark Gods united their powers under the banner of Archon the Ever Chosen. The first armies of the invasion were marshalled in the north, where Drenok Johansson's resistance was crushed, causing the remaining Norsecan tribes to ally themselves with Archon. The Nordic Dwarfs suffered a frighteningly fast invasion that forced them to retreat to their death in Sjoktraken, positioning Archon for a prime opportunity to invade Kislev. Katarin the Ice Queen left the capital to protect the Sacred Valley of Uspea, but in doing so, allowed Vardek Krom to descend upon Prague at the same time that Gutrot Spoom's plague fleet took Erengrad. The Ice Queen returned to the capital, but decisively lost the defense to Mordek the Damned, and retreated to Erengrad to expend the last of her ice magic in a futile and fatal attempt to prevent further invasion. Archon's advance was withheld for a time by Balthazar Gelt's Golden Bastion, but when an agent of Siege disguised himself as High Prince of Ulrich Valkyr and fooled Gelt into exposing his allegiance with necromantic magic in front of the Emperor's court, humanity's faith in the wall broke, and the Bastion crumbled without the support of Imperial Wizards. 
In the wake of the wall's disintegration, Chaos invaded Imperial territory, led by the Glotkin, while Gutrot's boom simultaneously sailed along the Sea of Claws and attacked all major ports along the northern shores of the Empire. Marienburg fell and provided the perfect route for Chaos to attack Altdorf, while the plagues of Nurgle seeped into both the lands of Bretonia and the Empire. With the Empire entrenched in war, the Skaven they insisted did not exist, launched a catastrophically successful invasion of Talea and Astalia, and began planning their insane mission to pull the Green Moon crashing down into the planet. At the same time, Britonia was locked in a bloody civil war that nearly swallowed the kingdom, until the arrival of the Green Knight liberated the kingdom from certain doom, revealed to be Gilles le Breton. Gilles silenced the rebellion with the decapitation of Malabord, approved a last errant war for Bretonia, and sent Loire to aid Altdorf as it slowly withstood a lengthy siege. The entire continent of Lustria was invaded by Skaven, whose grey seers struggled in a battle of cosmic power with the Slan over the moon. Master Mundi sacrificed himself to prevent the entirety of the moon from crashing into the planet, but a fragment of the moon broke off and threatened to send a devastating shockwave across the world. Lord Croak expended the last of his power to summon the Shield of the Old Ones to prevent total annihilation. The Lizardmen departed for the stars on their temples afterwards. In the continent of Ulthuan, Malekith abandoned Nagaroth as Valkyr invaded it to pursue one final attack on the Crescent Isle. The Witch King garnered a shocking amount of support from the High Elven Kingdoms once it was revealed that Malekith had indeed been the Phoenix King all along. Tyrion returned to the Isle and was elected regent of the island continent and seized the Sword of Cain, but to secure victory over both Tyrion and the Dark Gods, Teclis and Malekith unraveled the Vortex and sent the winds of magic sailing across the world to bind themselves to living hosts known as Incarnates. Without the Vortex, Ulthwan sank into the sea. Far in the east, Grimgor Ironhide led the biggest war the Warhammer world had ever seen, reaching as far as Cathay and the Ogre Kingdoms, and inspiring Greenskins from all over the world to join in the Sea of Green. Wurzag, the Great Green Prophet, declared Grimgor the Fist of Gwok, and Sarsnik the Fist of Mork, and the Greenskin Tide circled back to liberate their kin from the factories of the Chaos Dwarves before they were teleported away to partake in the final battle for the world. Nagash was revived through a ritual led by Manfred von Karstein with the intent to bestow upon the necromancer the power of a god, but at its completion it was revealed that a key sacrifice, Aliathra, was not the daughter of the Phoenix King, but instead Tyrion, leaving Nagash robbed of the true power he sought. Nagash sent his armies of undead south to reclaim the Black Pyramid managing to quietly infiltrate the Sea of Souls while Setra the Imperishable was distracted seeking the Destroyer of Eternities. By defeating the god of the underworld, Osirian, Nagash finally obtained the power he sought and brought ruin to Nehekara and defeated Setra. However, as quickly as the Black Pyramid was reclaimed and flown back to Sylvania, it was blown to smithereens by Skaven. Those same rats, whose numbers were in the millions by that time, invaded the Dwarf Kingdoms. Exploiting their stubborn nature, the Skaven attacked multiple fortresses at the same time, until all remaining battered Dwarven resistance consolidated at Karazakarak. Though High King Thorgrim led a heroic retaliation against the Skaven, the Rune of Eternity cracked and foretold a grim fate for the Kingdom. This was soon realized, as Deathmaster Snicht executed a perfectly timed assassination of the High King when his back was turned and doomed the everlasting realm. Then the refugees of the Dying Empire fled Altdorf and made for Averheim, while Vulten led a diversion to ensure the Emperor's safe retreat. His journey led him eventually to the besieged Middenheim. During Archon's siege of the city, Teclis infiltrated the walls in the dead of night and stole the flame of Ulrich to revive his brother Tyrion, who perished in Ulthuan's sinking. Without the flame, morale crumbled, and Middenheim was eventually taken by Archon, who prepared the final ritual to end the world. So soon the hour of fate comes around. The Everchosen stirs from his dark throne and prepares the blow that shall split the world asunder. Realms of old have fallen, lost beneath the fury of the Northlands, or smothered by vermin from below. 
Some heroes battle on, too stubborn to realize all hope is lost. Their time is past, and a new age of chaos and dismay beckons. Perhaps I am foolish also, for I fight with no hope of victory. I seek only to weaken the dark gods, to shake their hold upon the future. No other course remains, not to mortals, nor the divine. Prophecy of the End Times When the city of Middenheim fell, and the forces of order retreated southwest to Athel Lorin, the reality of the dire situation became clear to Nagash. Without a way to pursue the power of a god and the devastating loss of the Black Pyramid, the great necromancer weighed what choices were available to him with contempt, for none were agreeable with his pride. To join the Chaos Gods in their campaign to end the world would be akin to becoming a vassal, and to negotiate cooperation with the inferior mortal races was equally as detestable. Nevertheless, Nagash chose to march what was left of his undead hordes to Athel Loren, and in his absence, he appointed vampire queen Neferata to rule Sylvania. This infuriated Manfred, who still clambered for even the smallest crumb of power. Accompanying the great necromancer on his route to the Wood Elven realm, he simmered and pondered some means of revenge for this insult. Athel Loren will not suffer the presence of men, nor orcs, nor dwarves, nor beastmen. If a foe takes a single step upon such sacred soil, they shall not take another. Scarlock, Mistwalker of Athel Loren. Before the end times, visitors were rare within the territories of Athel Loren, and rarer still to emerge safely from the bows. The closely guarded halls of the King in the Woods were also home to the legendary Oak of Ages, an anchor for the web of life and death that bound together all living things, known as the Weave to the Wood Elves. Believed to be the heart and soul of the known world, its health had been successfully maintained even through the previous twelve ever chosen to arise and threaten the world. Now that the thirteenth apocalypse was upon their secretive realms, the forest became the last refuge for the incarnates to gather. Under the very political and loveless marriage between the now Eternity King Malekith and Everqueen Alariel, Athel Loren knew stability during the last days. Those would be short-lived as the weave shifted and the natural balance of the world became more and more destabilized. The destabilization brought with it disturbing madness, seeping deep into the woodland to corrupt the forest spirits. All across Athel Loren, hidden shrines and sacred glades were smashed and destroyed by corrupted treekin. When the forest was at its sickest, a sudden attack was suffered in the woodland of Aranok. A Slaneshi host, led by Belakor, the first demon prince of chaos, rampaged through the weakened Everwood. Upon his arrival, Tyrion was resurrected with the Flame of Ulric, Ariel's Divine Bones and the Heart of Avalon. With the Eternity King and the Everqueen's support, Belakor was driven to retreat at the hefty cost of half of Athel Lurin's defenders. The weave was stabilized for a moment, but the incarnates realized that they could not defend Athel Lorin in this manner forever. A great council was held in the King's Glade to decide their next and perhaps final move. The incarnates gathered and strategized with what little options they had. They agreed that in the long run their position was unsustainable and the world was doomed. Teclis reminded the council that the intentional unraveling of the Vortex had granted them the power to challenge even the Chaos Gods themselves with a fighting chance. Balthazar, who had been bound to the Wind of Metal after Thorgrim's assassination, inquired of the fate of the Wind of Death, Shaish. Teclis gave no response, but in the distance answered the warhorn of an undead army. Manfred von Karstein, with the remaining of Nagash's legions behind him, delivered a message to the forces of order. The great necromancer wished to parley. Still battered from their defense against the Slaneshi host, the incarnates hesitantly agreed to allow Nagash within the council. Trust between the factions was thin, and none trusted the words of the great necromancer. Teclis argued that his presence was vital to their success against the Chaos Gods, but Malekith interjected and suggested that the incarnates kill him there and then to allow the Wind of Death to be bound to another. Teclis rebuked this with the point that there were none who could both host the Wind of Death and be more trustworthy. The great necromancer offered an intriguing bargain. As a token of intent, 
Nagash offered Tyrion and Ilariel the architect of their daughter Aliathra's death. Manfred unwittingly agreed to this exchange, knowing that Arkan the Black was Aliathra's killer. However, with the truth known only between him and Nagash among those gathered, the great necromancer convinced the council that it was actually Manfred who had sent Aliathra's soul to damnation. Tyrion knew Manfred as his daughter's captor and believed this. He accepted Nagash's offer. Manfred was swiftly stolen away to a living root cage beneath the Oak of Ages, where he would be siphoned of power for the next hundred years in a slow, agonizing death. That was until an unexpected visitor greeted Manfred. Chased from the battlefield, but secretly remaining in Athol Loren to seek something to aid the mission of the Dark Gods, Belacor discovered the vampire Count locked away in his prison. Manfred bargained for his freedom by revealing to the Demon Prince a secret. Within the bickering Council of Incarnates, a goddess of the elven pantheon walked the realm in mortal form. Lilith, the goddess of the moon, was a particularly delicate soul that could be sent to Slanesh, Belacor gloated. For the reward of this information, Belacor freed Manfred, who, without allies, absconded to Middenheim. When Belacor located Lilith, he found her consoling the Bretonian Duke Gerrit. Kept concealed in the shadows, he overheard Lilith reveal to Gerrit that she had in fact been the Lady of the Lake since Bretonia's founding, for she had been denied the right to create a new race, and instead cultivated human worshippers that would protect the elven race and safeguard the known world. As the end of the world approached, she had created a realm known as the Haven, in which she hoped to safeguard the survivors of the current world, protected by the mighty Grail Knights. Betrayal and rage consumed Gerard, who drew his blade at the goddess. At that moment, Belacor leapt from the shadows, fearful that his prize was about to be taken from him. Gerard turned his blade from the goddess to the demon, and the two collided in a skirmish that left both severely wounded. While he could only force the demon to retreat, the time bought by Gerard provided the Incarnates time to react and capture Belacor who was brought before the council for interrogation and torture. It was revealed to his captors the unsettling truth of Archon's plan. The destruction of the Empire, or even Athol Loren, was not the primary objective of the Ever Chosen. Instead, beneath the deep rock of the Fauschlag in Middenheim, laid the key to the final ritual to end the world. Archon sought an artifact of the Old Ones that was powerful enough to create a rift even more potent than what the fallen Polar Gates caused in the very early years of the planet. If the ritual were successful, Belacor explained, the rift would drag the world into the Chaos Realm forever. Lilith advised the Council that in order to stop this ritual, they'd need to march to Middenheim themselves. However, all around them was destruction and ruin, and surely the attrition sustained from the journey would leave their armies too weak and ineffective. After Belacor's interrogation, he was imprisoned in a ruby of Alariel's crown, trapped as a powerless shadow. Even after sealing him away, Lilith sensed that the Chaos Gods had learned of the Haven, and she felt it slipping away from her. Time was running out, and swift action was needed if there was any hope to save the world. It was then that the goddess offered her life to Teclis so that he might use the last of her power to teleport the incarnates and their armies directly to Middenheim, surprise Archon's legions, and stop the ritual before it could be completed. Teclis hesitated, but the Emperor insisted that if a chance existed it should be taken. Lilith pressed a dagger into Teclis's hands and knelt before him. It cannot be a swift death, Lilith said. When my spirit passes, my divinity will pass with it, and your moment will be lost." She placed both of her hands around Teclis's, guiding the dagger's point until it rested a little to the left of her breastbone. There, she said with a warm smile, the perfect spot. Are you prepared? No, Teclis replied. Then he thrust the dagger home before his nerve could fail him. The Sacrifice of the Moon Goddess Lilith as the blood hunt of Khorne invaded Athel Loren, the death of Lilith provided Teclis with the magical font necessary to suddenly teleport the Incarnates and the last armies of the world to Middenheim. The disorder of their sudden arrival faded, and the final battle for the world commenced. The Incarnates were spread out upon their arrival in Middenheim. Teclis appeared in the most unfortunate location, Archon's throne room, 
and was captured by the Ever Chosen upon arrival. Manfred pledged support to Archon, and demons and Skaven alike were sent forth to engage the Incarnates and prevent them from reaching the center of the city. Malekith and the Vermin Lord collided in single combat, but the Eternity King realized that the Skaven had more reserves than previously expected. Suddenly, Grimgore and his gargantuan Wa arrived on the battlefield, teleported from across the world. Ogres and Greenskins flooded the city and took the fight to both sides, but Malekith and Grimgore met in single combat. After one round of dueling, Malekith realized that the Incarnate of Beasts, Avatar of Gork and Avatar of the Great Maw would decisively best him. Forged in a quick plan to divert the Orc's fury onto Archon, Malekith offered his sword, proclaimed Grimgore as vastly superior, and surrendered all elves to his might. The plan worked, Grimgore was pleased and accepted the elves into his war. Then, after being informed that Archon called him a weakling, turned his forces towards the center of the city and cleaved a path towards the Ever Chosen with horrifying efficiency. Nagash fared better in his initial arrival, but the advance of his undead army to the heart of the city was slowed to a grind by an innumerable horde of Slanesh demonettes. Arkan the Black took command of the undead, whilst the great necromancer carpeted the Chaos armies with deadly magic from the Wind of Death. As a lumbering giant flanked Nagash, Setra the Imperishable made a surprise reappearance and cleaved the behemoth to bits. He barked his demands to Nagash and ordered him to kill the Chaos Gods for offending the Imperishable, for Setra does not serve. Alariel, with the accompaniment of the ancient treeman of Athel Loren, Durthu, collided in a titanic battle against a horde of corn demons. The situation quickly became dire, until the arrival of Balthazar Gelt with the last of the dwarves and their war machines provided reinforcements. Alariel sustained a near-mortal wound, but in the last moment, Durthu gave all his life force to restore the Everqueen. She and Balthazar Gelt rode for the center of the city, leaving the rage of battle behind to make for Archon's ritual. As Gelt departed, the last of the dwarves erected their battle standards and prepared to die, knowing the odds were greatly stacked against them. The first High King of the Dwarves appeared, calling upon every dwarf to make their last stand. To their amazement, the fallen dwarf heroes Ungrim Ironfist, Thorgrim Grudgebearer, King Alfric of Carrick Hearn, Rune Lord Thoric Ironbrow, and Crag the Grim were summoned before the shield line, and the dwarves erupted in proud song as their enemy charged into them. Meanwhile, Tyrion and Karl Franz were teleported into Middenheim close to one another. Their combined cavalry regiments smashed right through waves of demons, until the powerful and high-ranking Huntmaster Kabander of Khorne momentarily stopped them. The Emperor was thrown from the battlefield and sent careening into Archon's throne room, which was discovered to be empty, as Archon had descended to guard the artifact. Karl Franz rushed for the Temple of Ulrich and found the warhammer Galmaraz itself, and when he recovered it, he shared his mortal form and shone bright with the wind of heaven. When Karl had perished in the Battle of Altdorf, he had not actually resurrected entirely. Instead, he became a host for Sigmar Heldenhammer himself. With the Warhammer back in his grasp, the God King had returned. In his first act of revival, he charged Kabanda and ended his life with two thunderous blows from the Warhammer. Finally, all incarnates arrived at the throne room and initiated their advance towards the ritual chamber, time running out swiftly. United, the Incarnates charged for Archon's Swords of Chaos, while Da Mortals of Grimgore pierced through the forces of Chaos. While Nagash's undead legions entangled with the demons, Malekith managed to free Teclis. Grimgore's advance was so swift, he could meet Archon face to face and challenge him. Their combined power was immense as their battle roared, and for a moment, it appeared as if Grimgore would best the Ever Chosen. The orc sent a headbutt into Archon's helmet and crushed the Eye of Shirian, robbing him of his ability to see the future and his magical prowess. Archon released the demon in his blade and gained an advantage in the fight, and finally cut down the orc and released the Lore of Beasts from Ironhide. With Archon weakened, Sigmar launched an attack and cornered Archon in a fated duel for the world. They struck down each other's mounts, Deathclaw and Dorgor, 
Sigmar taunted Archon, calling him by his original name of Diedrich Kastner, and labelling him weak for having given in to the demons and dark gods. In a rage, Archon disarmed Sigmar, but as the Everchosen went in for the final blow, the God King quoted the final words of the End Times prophecy, that he would be defeated by a hero of light. As he revealed this, his hand took the form of the twin-tailed comet, reached out for the Slayer of Kings, and shattered the weapon with his hand. He punched Archon twice and roared with fury, and the two were at last seen falling into an endless chasm created by the artifact of the Old Ones. The end was near, but there were a precious few moments left. The rest of the Incarnates gathered near the expanding portal to the Chaos Realm and used their winds of magic to cage and stop the expansion for the moment. Manfred snuck into the ritual chamber from the heat of battle and was presented with a choice, aid the Incarnates and save the world, or give in to the Chaos Gods and doom it. The Vampire Count decided that he'd rather serve the Chaos Gods than serve Nagash and the Incarnates, who had betrayed him and directly caused his humiliating imprisonment beneath the Oak of Ages. He lurched from the shadows and stabbed Balthazar Gelt in the back. Following Gelt's death, the Wind of Metal was released, and Teclis attempted to control it, but with so many winds bound to him, he disintegrated to ash. A domino effect followed, and all winds of magic were consumed by the portal that expanded at a cataclysmic rate. The world was swallowed totally by chaos, and the planet grew dark. The chaos gods grew bored with the ruined planet, and sought another planet to host their great game. But they failed to notice a tiny light within the darkness that was the Warhammer world. And in the void, a miracle took place. It was the end times, but it was also the beginning. Thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Enter PvP for all skill levels in this massive vehicle combat game on PC or consoles, and make sure to grab our large free bonus pack with premium features. Get it all via our link down in the description. Thank you for watching our video on the end times of Warhammer Fantasy. While the end times is arguably the most polarizing portion of the entire fantasy series, it leaves room for what could have happened if written a little differently. What would you have changed? Would the world be saved or still doomed to chaos? Leave your comments below and share your thoughts on the end times. More videos set in both the Warhammer Fantasy and Warhammer 40k universes are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we will catch you on the next one.